Good evening and welcome to another edition of Space Down Radio. Tonight we kick off a brand new week. And man, do we got a power week for you starting off tonight with author Ron Felber and the Mojave Incident. UFOs, aliens, hot button topics for tonight. And I'll tell you this exactly the way we like to start it off. It's like being on a par three on a golf course and you take your first shot and you get it within six inches of the pin right off the bat. That's our type of week so far. Let's say hello to everyone in our chat room so far. In the gold medal position, we got race fan. 11 takes home the silver. The gorgeous Ozzy Ange with a bronze medal tonight. Jack Clark, good to see you. Thanks for coming on in. Tom and Big Willie, what's happening, everyone? The gorgeous Steph Dickey has returned. Eddie Haskell, nice to have you here. As we scroll on down, there's our buddy Nicola and the stunning Cosmic Floor. What is happening, you two? Hope you had a great weekend. Thanks for coming on back. Spooky Morales is here, everyone. The Ronald Penton, everyone. The Ronald Penton. He'll be signing autographs after the show. Line up to the left of the studio, if you don't mind. Oracles and beyond looking lovely tonight. Oracles, the lovely maiden, will be signing autographs after the show as well. Line up to the right of the studio. Grand Paul Holland in Australia. Good to see you. Todd Purden, nice to have you back. The best name on YouTube. Dry Toast is here. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate that. As we scroll on down, who else we got? There's Downshift. Good to see you. And who else we got here? Uh, uh, the Michael Leger is here, everyone. Yes, the Michael Leger. Jurassic Joey, the lovely Jenny. Nice to see you both. As we continue on, there's Mennonite Abe hanging on out. Luscious Jules, good to see you. And uh, there's Double Tim. Nice to have you back, Double Tim. And uh, we continue our scrolling on down. And there's EQA. How are you doing? Long time, no time. Scrolling on down here. Mama Susan, thanks for coming on in. And uh, who else we got here? <coughs> the gorgeous Elaine, thanks for coming back. Applesauce, good to see you. Chillin' Villain, nice to have you back. And we uh, continue on scrolling. And uh, Jerry O'Brien, nice to have you here. Uncle Dale and his power stash are here from Austin, Texas. Remember, if you are in Austin, Texas, and you see Uncle Dale rub his power stash, you will get the entire November filled with good luck. So make sure you do that. Cable Guy Matt is here. Remember, you can get your free piece of Autograph coaxial cable, courtesy of Cable Guy Matt. You cannot buy these in stores, people. Limit one per household. Richard Elmore, nice to see you. Thanks for coming on in. Noble Patrick, BGs, good to see you guys. Our man, Vin Man, how you doing, buddy? Good to see you. <coughs> Sorry about the coughing. Robert Moore, nice to have you here. The gorgeous Carol, good to see you. The stunning and talented Larry. There is the beautiful Jessica McCreary. Digger Dog, nice to have you back. Major Lee, thanks for coming on in. Davey, an open-minded uh, clarity. Good to see you guys. Hey, Drew Morris. And B, welcome to our chat room for the first time. The gorgeous and talented Kara McIver from Saskatchewan. Everybody wave. She will wave back because it's so flat there. We'll all be able to see her. All right, moving on. There's sweet Donnie D and Rich Hilke. Uh, the gorgeous Nicole Sackage has returned. Bealzebrad, nice to see you. Grandmaster, nice to have you back. Smoking Joe, good to have you here. Mmm, looking lovely tonight. Virgil, where have you been hiding? Good to see you. Who else we got here? Sensational Sherry, the lovely and talented Kira. Uh, Lee P, how you doing, buddy? Good to see you. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Big Papa, welcome to our chat room for the first time. Thank you for joining us. And Cat Chaser, the lovely Cat Chaser, thank you for kicking off the Super Chat. The Super Chat is a great way to support what we do on Spaced Out Radio on a nightly basis. So thank you so much for doing that. We're about 20 seconds away. Mama Susan, nice to see you. And uh, let's see, who else do we have here? James Smith, good to have you here. Mondak, nice to see you. TMI, nice to have you back. Sovereign, how you doing, buddy? John Hudson, Reverend Keith. Can I get an amen from you, Rev? <coughs> Sorry, we're going to be uh, sore throat all night long here, guys. Mike Palumbo, good to see you. We are caught up. Get your horns up. We're going to rock and roll here momentarily with Mr. Bumblefoot. We got a show to run. Let's do it right now.
from the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world. This, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. All right, here we go. Ron Felber, author of fiction and nonfiction books, including television and documentary films. But his biggest book has been The Mojave Incident. Now, this one gets a little weird, people, because it talks about true details of a UFO encounter, aliens, and so much more. Ron began writing his career as a deputy sheriff writing for True Detective magazine. He then went on to pen novels for the iconic Nick Carter series with titles such as The Blue Ice Affair, Death Mission Havana, and Blood Ultimatum. But it's all about UFOs and aliens tonight with our good friend Ron Felber, who's packing one seriously good-looking mustache. Ron, welcome to Spaced Out Radio. How are you? Hold on, I got to get your mute off here. There we go. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing just fine, Dave. Good to be here. Good to have you here. I'm going to apologize for my throat right off the bat because I am battling a cold. I Uh am battling a cold. But for you, being a former police officer, did you always believe in UFOs? No. Uh, Actually, it isn't something I thought a lot about. Um, Like a lot of people, you know, I grew up with uh, Rod Serling in the Twilight Zone, and I I always thought those kind of stories were, were interesting. But as far as UFOs, when I was a kid, there was a story called uh, uh, a book by Frank Edwards called UFOs Serious Business. And I, I took a look at that. And again, it was of interest. But uh, as I grew older, uh, went into business, you know, went to school, etc. It was something that was very far from my mind. So how do you go from police <laughs> officer to a love of writing, which I can understand because I have a love of writing, too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, albeit my radio side is like 45 seconds. What can I jam into 45 yeah, seconds? Yeah. Whereas you're like writing novels and everything, which isn't fair because it's so different. It really is. But how did you go from transitioning from police officer to writer? Did you always have an interest in writing? Oh, always. Yeah. I, I Since the, the sixth grade, you know, it was one of those things where a teacher, you hear sometimes a teacher changed somebody's life. I can really say that about uh, my teacher in the sixth grade. Uh, we had essays to write, you know, maybe about my summer vacation or who's my hero, uh, et cetera. And I wrote up a, a, uh, a piece on the baseball player, Willie Mays. And uh, she came up to me and said, you know, this isn't the best paper, but it's the most unique paper. You, you have a talent for writing. And, you know, uh, at 12 or whatever age I was, th- those kind of things make a real impact. And, and it did. And uh, I started writing short stories in the seventh grade, I, I guess, and got them published in my brother's high school magazine. So when I was in the seventh grade, sixth, seventh grade, I was writing stories that were getting published. So I had about 30 stories published in, uh, in scholastic type magazines. And I won an award uh, for best short story, national uh, award. Uh, and then I really just started writing novels and uh and uh, had the the good fortune when I was at Georgetown to meet William Peter Blatty, the author of The Exorcist, who really became a kind of mentor for me. Wow. Mm. That's interesting. What was it like meeting him? He's a great guy. I mean, he's passed away, unfortunately. And, you know, I I have to say, sometimes in your life, there's like almost a a brick removed, you know? And uh, that's kind of the way it was with Bill Blatty. Uh, He he was a, a very intelligent guy came from almost nothing, you know, uh, in New York, was the, uh, the son of, of immigrants, uh, immigrants from uh, Lebanon. His father deserted the family when he was a baby. And uh, he got a scholarship to a, a high school, a prep school, 
then got a scholarship to Georgetown, was a comedy writer, and then uh, he did, did a shot in the dark. He invented Inspector Clouseau, along with Blake Edwards, who was very funny, by the way. So then that kind of dried up. And in 1949, there was a story in the newspaper about a boy that was possessed. He put it in his wallet and carried it around with him. And in 1970 or so, he said, you know, my comedy is not doing so well. Maybe I'll write a novel. So very bright and for me, just uh, very supportive. What was your first novel? I wrote a book. <laughs> I will tell you when it was a long time ago. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I was I was uh, maybe 21, I guess, something like that. And I wrote a book called uh, The Indian Point Conspiracy. And it was about a nuclear reactor uh, in uh, Indian Point, New York, that terrorists took over. So uh, it's not a bad little plot. Of course, it's a, the writing was a little primitive by, by my standards today. So here you are, you're still a police officer. You decide to get into the writing game and, and kind of let your imagination flow. How much did, did the writing take a stress off a very stressful job? Because I know for a lot of people who have high stress jobs like that, you need an outlet somewhere. A lot of people turn to the bottle. A lot of people yeah, turn to <laughs> womanizing or, or yeah. whatever it may be. But for you, for you, you turned to pen to paper and the typewriter and then eventually the computer. I yes. mean, how much of an outlet was that for you? Well, you know, it, it's, it's, it, I'll just tell you frankly, um, when I got out of college, I went to Georgetown, I was in debt. It was about $40,000 in debt uh, from the college loans. And uh, my parents' home was the sort of uh, collateral for it. So I needed to get a job. And it was just in the middle of a, a recession when these gas shortages, OPEC gas shortages, and lines for gasoline at, uh, at stations. So they weren't hiring. And I needed to get a job. And uh, at the time, uh, being a, uh, a deputy sheriff and uh, transporting prisoners, which is what I did, uh, paid a reasonable amount of money so I could pay my loans down. And I was not so happy about having to do that, given, you know, the, all the money I spent on a degree. But in retrospect, it was probably the most important thing that ever happened to me in terms of writing. So in a way, it's a little turn. The, the people that I met, the criminals, the hitmen, the terrorists, guys that hijacked airplanes to Cuba and came back. Very fascinating people. Not nice people, but fascinating people. So I started writing for True Detective. And uh, and really, in many of my stories, uh, those, those characters, the way they talk, the way they act, uh, they're, they're, they're things you can use. Norman Mailer says writers are like squirrels. They pack away acorns into their nest and then take them out one at a time when they need them. So that's what those stories were for me. When I was in the middle of writing a novel or a book, I said, you know, this guy could be a good character, you know? And so it goes like that. For you, as you decided to start writing about true crime and, and the stories that go along with that fiction and both nonfiction, how did you enter the UFO game? You know, I, I uh, finally, I did get a job and uh, in, in business. And I was a, uh, uh, a division manager, they call it, for, a, for an industrial company, manufacturing company. And I had some salespeople under me. One of them was a young guy I hired uh, in California, in the Southern California. And um, we got to be very good friends. So when I was on the West Coast, you know, we'd have lunch together and just talk about kids, talk about whatever, business mostly, actually. But uh, he said, you know, I know you're a writer and I really like the way you write. I've read your stuff. I have a friend who I played football with in college. He's my best friend and he's sort of a wreck. And so is his wife because they have a secret. I promised him that I wouldn't tell anyone, but I know you so well and I know them so well. And I think it would be a good thing if you met. So we did, and I was very reluctant. You know, the first thing I said to him, I said, I, I don't do that kind of thing. I, it's just not what I do. I was doing spy novels. I was doing suspense thrillers. So UFOs were like, you know, 
very far off in terms of a, a genre. So he, he introduced me to them and I said, you know, here are these two people, you know, well-educated. The guy is a project manager for building shopping centers. So, you know, he's handling millions of dollars. He's handling workers. This is no, you know, just somebody. He's, he's really a responsible person. They had two kids. Uh, the woman was, uh, they met in college. He was a football star, all state football star. And, and you say, why on earth would somebody invent a story? I mean, is this going to, what is this going to do for him except cause uh, ridicule? And probably hurt, hurt his chances at his job, you know. So I, I believe them. And they told me the most incredible story I've ever heard. And uh, I decided to write the book because mostly because of them. It wasn't something I ever thought about. Even when I first heard the story, I go, this is, this is unbelievable. But then I took them to a, a, a National Center of Psychiatry in Washington, D.C., I had them evaluated for like if they were prone to fantasy, if they were unstable in any way. And came back. These are like the backbone of America, you know, very, very solid people. And then I had them retrogressed uh, by an FBI hypnotist that I, I got in contact with who was who was good enough to do the do the work. And what came out of all of this is, is uh, an incredible book, I think, The Mojave Incident and an incredible story. And I would say beyond that, an important story. We're going to get into that story as we progress here in the show. I just want to continue to learn about you. Sure. How, how much as a non-believer to the UFO phenomena did this change you personally? Well, for, for one thing, I, I find at this point, since I've delved into it, you know, once you write a book like this, you're sort of in in the the circle where you, you hear a lot of things, you, you watch a lot of things because you become fascinated by the topic. And what changed is, first of all, I, I think the evidence for UFOs, for extraterrestrial craft visiting Earth is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. Any, any judge sitting on a bench, if they looked at this evidence, would say, certainly it's possible it's probable, and it's almost certain. Hmm. So how enlightening was that for you? Like, I mean, I could just imagine what it was like. I, I've always been on the side that UFOs are real, mm -hmm. even before my encounters. Yeah. So for you as a non-believer, as a guy who's all about the facts, because yeah. that's what you have to be as a exactly. Believer, you know, I mean, did it send you for a little bit of a loop? Did you get some sleepless nights or just sit around scratching your head saying, what the hell did I get myself into here? Yeah, um, you're, you're right about that. I mean, I, I'm, a, I guess, a fairly analytical guy. And yeah, maybe a, a bit of a detective in that sense. You know, I, I want to investigate and find out what's true. And so you look for facts, you look for holes in stories, you look for inconsistencies. And uh the more I looked into it, the more I, I just couldn't find anything that would discredit them and um, many, many things that would uh, lead you to believe that they were telling the truth and that this really happened. What people say all the time is, well, I believe that you believe it happened. Well, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying what the, the retrogressive hypnotist said. I believe that this everything you're saying happened to you. It's not a matter of, of thinking it happened to you. It happened to you. And that's where I came uh, to the conclusion, this is real. Then I started to look into more evidence about all this. And um, I, I have to say, you know, you become a little obsessed with it. And I, I suspect that uh, it's not a conversation. Every, everybody in, you know, everybody in a, uh, in, a, in a company, let's say, would want to talk about. You know, but it's something you want to talk about because you think you've found a truth that's uh, that's very important that people seem oblivious to. And that's almost scary. What was your inner circle like when you told me you were writing a UFO book? Well, these are business guys. They 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 thought they thought I was kind of crazy, I think. And uh, at first they thought, you know, it, it was you know, I don't know, maybe a comedy or something, you know, it just wasn't in my, 
DNA to, to do something like that. But uh, as they realized it was true, and I had tapes and whatnot, recordings and, and hypnotic sessions, and I, which I shared with a couple of people, none of them, I have to say, I don't think I convinced anybody that, uh, that UFOs are real. Of course, this was a while ago. Um, and I think a lot of things have changed. But the people that are skeptics, and even the just people that aren't skeptics, it's amazingly, it's almost hard to comprehend that they're unfazed. I mean, these things may be the biggest story in the history of humankind. And, and it's like, oh yeah, I think I'll have the uh, cheese sandwich. <laughs> it just doesn't register. And I find that astounding. So this story is going back a few years now, and, and yeah. over the past number of years, we've had major changes in the UFO world, especially the last four years, yep. where all of a sudden there's a lot of people with egg on their face who are now understanding that this major conspiracy theory about spaceships and potentially life from elsewhere is no longer a tinfoil hat subject anymore. How has this changed your outlook moving forward? Do you follow the subject quite closely now? Or was it, I've done the book, I'm a believer now, I don't need to do any more? No, no, I think I think my girlfriend would tell you, I watch everything that, uh, that's on uh, TV, anything on the YouTube, any article I can get my hands on. Uh, like I said, it becomes a bit of, a, of an obsession. And you know, it was funny, I was just watching a show and the comedian Jackie Gleason, yes, he was a fanatic about UFOs and had a, a very interesting story to tell. But it, it, it's like, I guess it's like, uh, you know, the word fan probably comes from fanatic, but you become a fan of the topic. And uh, yeah, I know I devour anything that has anything to do with it because I think, I think it's important. I think it's, you know, incredibly important. From an outsider's perspective, then, what do you think the truth is when it comes to UFOs? Well, uh, that that's kind of a long story, but I'll give you the short answer. We have, we have five minutes, so no, sure, can... yeah, sure. I, I think that I'll give the. I think I think that there's a um, an evolution that's gone on. Let's say, say since the 40s, 49, 47, where people are desensitized, and I think that. This is almost, uh, for, for example, you get, have a, some photographs taken of flying saucers, as they call them, flying discs over the Himalayas. So fine, that's a, a grainy photo. It's in Life magazine or whatever. You hear about Roswell, but many years later, uh, and, and that in, in situation. Then you hear other people say, I, I saw this object. You see them on the news or something. I'm talking about now the 50s, let's say. Uh, then in the 60s, and, and it becomes a, a popular topic. You know, it's, it's a, something that people talk about a lot and, and are curious about. Then you have the Betty and Barney Hill story where they were abducted and they were retrogressed. And, you know, they had, I mean, again, very credible people. And then, you know, you have what's gone on more recently with the Pentagon. These are all steps that move closer and closer to a major encounter, in my view, between um, extraterrestrials and uh, you, human beings. Do you ever think that we are going to get to that point where there is some sort of disclosure? You know, I was reading a comment by George Knapp today on Twitter who basically said, you know, we're still a long ways from any sort of disclosure type movement, but we are traveling pretty much in the right direction. What do you think about that? What do you feel about the purpose of disclosure? Is it real? Is it something that we should be striving for? Or is it just impossible? No, I think it's very, more than possible. I think it's going to happen. And my bet would be that it's going to happen in, uh, if you have children and you're a certain age, let's say 50, just to put out a number. If you have kids and you're 50, I think in their lifetime, there will be a major, not disclosure, there'll be a major encounter. And I think that's what this is moving inexorably towards. And, and you, you know, I, I think so too. Do you think society, though, as we got about three minutes left, is ready for any kind of disclosure? 
I mean, I, I always look, like to use the example with our audience, Ron. I look at the way we've treated people through COVID. And I don't talk a lot of COVID here. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I don't care yeah. either mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, if you look at everything, you know, I mean, we've all seen the videos of people hoarding toilet paper, yeah. buying $2,000 worth of meat, even though they don't need it, hoarding mm -hmm. milk and, and all sorts of types of products, treating the neighbor like, like they're garbage, you know, and become very uh, introverted. What, what is your opinion on that? Do you have an opinion? Yeah, sure I do. I think it's going to happen whether those people want it to happen or not. I think it's just, it's just even now, even as we sit here today, I think this is in your face. I mean, I think this is like somebody nudging you, you know, from the back and say, Hey, I'm here. Look at this. And, and people seem, some people and, and many people understand what's going on. Many people uh, are curious and maybe don't quite understand or maybe don't quite uh, comprehend, you know, the, the, the weight of this, but, uh, I think it's going to happen one way or the other. And I think there'll be a couple of major events that lead up to it. You think so? And one of them is the Pentagon already. Yeah. Well, it, it all depends. See, my big thing with it all is I think, and I could be wrong here, but I think there are so many secrets that the U S government has with this phenomena Mm -hmm. that they're trying to figure out a path where they don't have to give a, out those secrets. So true disclosure may be a straight line, but the U.S. government wants to take this big detour around. So that way we don't need to know about Roswell. We don't need to know about Phoenix. We don't need to know about Kecksburg or, or what's happened with crash retrievals, whether or not we have contact and, and that contact has been happening since the 1940s. I think there are so many secrets that they are trying to protect that there's no way we'll ever get the true truth. I, I agree. I, I, I don't think so. And, and uh, it, it almost seems like governments generally around the world, you talk about freedom, free speech, et cetera, are, are more likely to hold things back than ever before. Uh, there's a kind of iron fist mentality around the world. And uh, I think, I think the odds of that, uh, of, of the disclosure coming from the governments is very, uh, very slim. I think the way it'll happen is literally people say, I want a, a UFO and a little man to walk out on the White House lawn. I think that's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, I'm going to let you uh, sit right there. We're going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. Author Ronald Felber is our guest tonight. The Mojave incident, what happened in the desert? California. We'll find out. Let's talk aliens. Let's talk UFOs. Yes, here we can still say aliens, people. Spaced Out Radio continues right after this. I'm surviving so far. I'm surviving. Yeah, you're struggling through a little bit, huh? Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll make it, though. We'll make it. Thank you, Dirt Road, for that awesome super chat, my friend. And thank you, Space Cow and Murray and Cat. Really appreciate it. There we go. All right. We got five minutes. Five minutes here just to hang out. Now, our YouTube audience and our Twitch audience can hear us. So okay. uh -huh. uh, just let you know. Well, I, I appreciate this. It, actually, I really enjoy the the questions are are very very good ones, and uh, it's uh, it's fun to answer them. Well, thank you. We're only going to get more interesting now. I think so. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> this was the warm up, huh? <laughs> well, you know what? I never uh, the one thing I learned a long time ago about this show is I never ask the good questions right off the bat. Mm -hmm. the reason why is a a lot of guests are very nervous, mm -hmm. and b the audience trickles in, and once we hit about that bottom of the hour, the majority of our audience is already tuned in. I see. So there's no point in asking that first half hour. Yeah. The, the really poignant questions when we, yes. when we, yeah. uh, and then people miss it because then all of a sudden I'll get questions later on in the show. Can Ron a answer this and be like, he answered that in the first half hour? Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. No, it's great format. It's a great format. Oh, thank you. 
Thank you. We do our best here. So are commercials running now or how does that go? Is there a, are you yeah. waiting? <clears throat> we have to time everything out to our radio side of things. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the way we do it. So this show will run tomorrow night on our radio affiliates. We have six mm -hmm. radio affiliates. So I have to, uh, I have to time everything out to their, their timing. I see. That's kind of what I'm doing right now. And, uh, um oh gorgeous jenny turned 70 just two days ago or yesterday happy birthday jenny we love you around here and uh, you're so you're here every night with us and we absolutely love you happy birthday on behalf of all of us at spaced out radio much love my dear <clears throat> So, Dave, I want to get some water, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, you go ahead. We've yeah. got uh, four minutes, three oh. minutes, three minutes. That's a nice kitchen. <laughs> a big thank you to birthday Jenny. The gorgeous Kira, Sally, our Dutch princess, the lovely Dirt Road, Murray, Space Cow, and Cat. <coughs> oh, gosh. I hope I make it tonight. I really do. Thank goodness I got lots of cough candies. Really appreciate you guys. Uh, thank you so much. Super Chat is a great way to um, to um, support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. Yes, uh, Downshift. We we used to go live on our radio programs, uh, but it uh, works better if they play it the night after. So we've been playing it the night after for about a year now since we picked up the affiliate in Mississauga. Uh, Kaiju, how you doing? Uh, yes, uh, Ron is retired from law enforcement. And who else we got here? <clears throat> Nose vaping with Dave. Yes, v Vix inhaler is a godsend for radio mm -hmm. people. Vix inhaler. It's a beautiful thing. All right, we have about uh, 45 seconds. Okay. Grady Strickland, flash forward. How you doing, guys? Good morning there, Commonwealth Andrew. 20 seconds. Remember, a big way to support what we do on this nightly basis is hit that subscribe button, ring that bell if you haven't already. We are here seven days a week for your listening ears. The Super Chat is open, a great way to support what we do. And you know what? If you uh, go to our website, spacedoutradio.com forward slash shop, we got some very, very nice swag for you. Here we go, everyone. Second half hour. Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. Author Ron Felber is here. He's got a great book out called The Mojave Incident. 
deals with the family, UFOs, extraterrestrials. Now, in the first half hour, Ron, as we bring you in now, Mm -hmm. you were telling us that you didn't believe in this subject. You didn't believe that this phenomenon was real. You were pretty much like everybody else out there who thinks it's just a bunch of tinfoil hat wearing weirdos. And then then you found out it was real. So take us to the introduction of your book and and the family you and how you learned about this story. Yeah. Um, I had, had had a, a, a friend that, uh, that worked with me and his name was Paul Moran, as a matter of fact, and he, he lived in Los Angeles. I was on the East coast at the time. And, um, we, we became friendly over time. And if I was out on the West coast, we would have lunch or dinner or whatever. And uh, he introduced me to his best friend who, um, he played football with in college at the university of Redlands and, um, and, and told me he had had an experience. He told me also that he was sort of sworn to secrecy because these people didn't really want to talk about it. But knowing that I was a writer and knowing that his friend was and his wife were really in desperate straits psychologically after having gone through this experience, he thought it would be good for both of us to meet. And um, I did meet them and I was I was incredibly impressed with just how straightforward how responsible how uh you know not prone to exaggeration or fantasy or anything like that just almost the backbone of america kind of you know of people and um and they told me their story and as fantastic as it was piece by piece i became more convinced that they were telling the truth that this really happened and there was no other explanation for it but the one they came to, which was they had an alien encounter. So when did this event happen? It happened uh, October 1989, the 21st and the 22nd, October 21st and 22nd, 1989. And I can tell you a little bit of how it, it happened. Uh, is that yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. They, uh, the Giffords are their names, and uh, it was a couple had a, two children and um the mother the the uh, wife was a new mother and as you might imagine with uh, little children she was sort of anxious to get out of the house and do something exciting that wasn't being a mother (laughs) or a housewife and so uh he on the other hand was a hunter uh he had a great job he was a, a um a project manager for constructing shopping malls which is a very responsible job. And he was a hunter. His father would take him hunting, his brother as well. And the season before, he had missed a shot at a mule deer. And uh, his father and brother were relentless in teasing him about it. So as competitive as this fellow was, a former college football player, he wanted to get that mule deer. So they were sort of at odds as to what to do. So they decided to do both. They were going to go into the Mojave Desert and he would do his hunting, but she would go with him to a place called Whiskey Pete's, which was along the way. They'd camp at Midland's uh, campsite and then go into the Mojave. So both of them would, would pretty much get what they wanted. That was the compromise they worked out. Okay, so here they go into the Mojave and it's obviously in the middle of fa- fall. What were they doing? Where were they going at that time? Yeah, this this is a, you know, these coincidences. It, it's funny when you see things happen from a distance, from a little bit of a distance and over time, you say, well, gee, that's an amazing coincidence. That, that isn't the way it felt to them at the time. But this Midlands campsite where they were going to stay uh, for the night after going to Whiskey Pete's. So they went to the Midlands campsite with their camper and uh, we're going to stay. It, it's it's never f- full it's you know uh, that's really unheard of but when they got there it was full and they were waved along and they couldn't they couldn't uh, spend the night there so steve uh, you know uh being you know the the pioneer let's call it the, the guy that that's going to you know get things move things forward said look uh let's go into the desert we have our camper. 
we have some steaks, we have, you know, we'll make a fire, we'll have a romantic, uh, you know, time in the desert, we'll do stargazing, sure. have, uh, have some food, and, uh, and make the best of it. So, uh, so his wife uh, agreed, and, and why, they went into the desert. And why wouldn't you? I mean, why not? A romantic night of, of uh, <laughs> you know, under the stars in the middle of yeah. the desert. I mean, that just sounds like a one, uh, a fantastic time. Yeah, but it, but it turned out not to be. <laughs> this is where you add in the yeah, but Dave. <laughs> <laughs> what what happened? This is you know these are again the coincidence was the one thing. So then they get in the desert and they do exactly that. They make a campfire, and again uh, the husband uh, Tom was was good at that. He was you know he was an outdoorsman. And uh, his wife, Elise, you know, sort of followed along. In any case, they made a campfire. They had their camper there. They cooked up some steaks. And uh, interesting, but he thinks he sees something out of the corner of his eye. Now, it's a mountainous area. It's in the New York mountains, surround the desert. The tabletop mountain is in front of them. And there's a smaller mountain to the side. And he glances over and thinks to himself, did I just see something? Now, his wife is already a little nervous because they're in the middle of the desert alone. She's heard and read articles that, you know, gangs, motorcycle gangs and whatnot meet there and do drugs or have drugs and transport that people get killed there, you know, because of the, the isolation of it. It, it attracts, it can attract sort of outlaw, outlaw people. So she was nervous about, about, you know, being held up, maybe raped or whatever. That was in the back of her mind, being so isolated as they were. So what he did see, because it popped out again, almost like a game, was a UFO. Oh, wow. And this would be three, 400 feet away incredibly visible and when he sees it it goes back he doesn't want to say anything to to elise because she's already nervous and can you imagine if he told her that so he sort of plays it down but then he notices there's no sound in the desert they had been feeding i guess they're, they're squirrel type uh you know uh creatures, animals that that, uh, that are in the desert, they were feeding bread to them, you know, it's just as a sort of game. There were a lot of sounds in the desert at night that you wouldn't imagine, but there are. And all of a sudden they stop. He's thinking back to a time when he was 12 years old, when he sees this, this object. When he was 12 years old, he was fishing with a friend, another 12 year old, and they saw a light in the sky the light in the sky approached and approached and approached and they were looking at it like that's really strange but then they got really frightened and so they ran they ran back to the campsite as this thing was approaching almost hovering over them and they tell their parents and their parents are there having a good time of course with other other parents and you know they discard what they say they don't you know they don't take it seriously but that's the first thing that crashes into Tom's mind when he sees that, that, that UFO behind the mountain. And now the situation is more than tense. As a big, rough, tough football player, I mean, this guy is used to a lot of rough stuff. Yep. I mean, how was... How was he feeling? I believe Mr. Gifford is his name. Yeah. And how was he feeling through all of this? How was he able to hold it together for his wife and his family? Well, you're right. He is a tough guy. And he is a resp really responsible guy. You know, he's just one of those people that I don't know if you were in a foxhole and, uh, and being attacked by somebody, you'd want him next to you. You know, he, he keeps his wits about him and He's a, sort of a man's man, I mean, in, in that sense. So uh, he, he's, he's shocked and frightened, but he's also stoic about it. He doesn't, doesn't want to alarm 
uh, Elise, his wife, he doesn't want to do that because who knows where that would go. It, you know, it could just ruin everything. And, and, and maybe he thinks to himself, maybe I, maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I just saw something. I, I don't know. But it was very clear. So the sound has stopped. They're looking at stars now. And so uh, Tom is a, you know, knows a lot about the outdoors. So he's pointing out to his wife, well, this is this star and this is this constellation. And you see that that's a double star. And so she's looking, identifying these, these uh, constellations and stars with him. And then she says, you know, if that's a double star, that must be a triple star because it was larger and brighter than anything in the sky. So he, he thinks about it a bit, makes the connection between that a little bit and the UFO that he saw previously. And uh, they watch stunned as that one object becomes nine objects. And the nine objects form an M, an M configuration over the mountaintop that they're staring out at, which is about 300 yards or so, 400 yards away. No, no not that far, 200 yards away. So they can see this M, it's nine, nine bright, bright orbs. That's not bad enough. They start blinking at one another, like a kind of communication. So Elise says to him, what, what, what is going on? Do you think we're in the middle of some military exercise because there were some bases around? And he goes, I, I don't know. Then she says, well, he says, well, maybe, maybe it's, it's some other country or something. There were some, some rumblings in the Middle East at that time, Operation Desert Storm. Maybe it's an a, a army uh, exercise, and these are some kind of uh, secret craft. Well, the nine become hundreds. And then they start dropping to the ground. They drop to the ground as these white orbs. They're looking straight at them. And then they see red eyes, red eyes that these white orbs either are carrying or are a kind of gremlins. That's the way they describe it. And they have red eyes and they're on rushing towards them. Now, Tom's adrenaline and survival instinct kicks in. So he runs to the, uh, the camper, gets his Ithaca shotgun and a seven millimeter Browning rifle. And he says, you know, whatever it is, you know, I'm going to defend us. So, of course, Elise's wife is petrified. And so is he. And uh, they get this telepathic message. Her first, she's much more sensitive to communications and just detail than he is. Just the way it is. Maybe it's just, you know, a female thing versus a male thing. I don't know. But she goes, I, 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 they don't want you. They don't want you to fight. It's useless. They want you to go in back of the camper. They want us to go in the back of the camper. And that keeps repeating, go in the in our head. And then he drops his weapon or puts his weapon to the side, lowers it, and he hears the same thing. And as if sort of hypnotized, they go into the back of the camper. And uh, in the back of the camper, they sit Indian style, him with the gun across his, his legs, slap and two they call them monitors so these two sort of electrical uh whether i won't call them beings uh, objects let's say are are in the camper's tailgate and uh they can't move every time he moves to get out they move forward and he gets a tremendous jolt of electricity an electric shock so they're really trapped they have no way of getting out. It's like their camper is now a prison cell. Exactly. Exactly. 
Man. By these little electrical beings that look like gremlins. With the red the electrical beings are, are the monitors and the guards, let's call them. These other gremlin-type beings are, they call them, they said like, uh, almost like monkeys or, or that kind of thing. Uh, frenetic. Um, but evil, they felt like this was, these were not, this was not a, a, a good thing, not a pleasant thing. And literally, they're going over the camper, they're in the trees, hundreds of them. And, uh, the wife says to uh, to Tom, uh, "Is this is this real?" He says, "Pinch me, pinch me. I'll pinch you. Do you feel that?" Yeah, you know we're not dreaming, and they're terrified, of course, absolutely of course. terrified. Their hearts are pumping like you can't believe. And uh, he says, "Tell me what you see right now." And he they, he describes it to her, and she describes it to him, so they're they're on the same page. They're, they're looking at the same things just to question the reality of things. Then um, a, a, a very interesting thing happens and probably the most important. And the point I wanna make is this story is almost like a, a veil or a curtain being pulled up on a new reality, on a different reality. It's, it's very large in scope. So what happens then is a craft comes over them the craft is so big, it covers the valley. He estimated that it was the size of a football field. And as Fife Symington, the governor, former governor of Arizona, has said, having a similar sighting of an object the size of a football field, there is no craft that size of that magnitude that can get in the air. There's no, no craft that we have that can even resemble this. Hanging on the uh, uh, underbelly are, uh, are nine smaller craft, smaller UFO type crafts, you know, saucer type crafts. A beam of light comes down and uh, now they see around them the most terrifying thing you could imagine, these illuminated beings. And the way they describe them is they're bright as light, you know, not yellow light, white light. And uh, they have the torsos maybe of a five-year-old. They have spindly legs, spindly arms, uh, eyes, large, large bulbous eyes that don't have pupils. Not eyes like your eyes or mine, alien eyes. They surround the camper. And now just imagine, just imagine, there's this craft above them. They're locked in this camper. They're surrounded by nine of these illuminated beings. And uh, they start getting telepathic messages from that, from those, those beings. But around that same time, the beam of light starts sucking things up into it. Cactus, trees, cattle, whatever, insects sucks these things up into it. So they're watching this thing scour the desert basin. And another sort of a triangular, smaller, very small compared to the craft, uh, they called it the searcher. It's a triangular thing with, with, with red, white, and amber lights. And it was combing the basin of the desert as if, as if they were looking to mine something, like to test what's under the ground and bring it up. As it turns out, uh, Alumax uh, does mine in that area and they're rare earths and, uh, and elements that are used in laser weaponry, et cetera. So they think maybe that. So in the meantime, just, just imagine again, this searcher is combing the desert floor. This UFO caps the valley with a, a beam that in diameter is probably about a hundred feet sucking things up into it. These gremlin type beings are all around them. And these nine illuminated figures surround the camper. The telepathic messages they get, it's almost like they put a syringe in their brain and sucked out experiences. So it was a kind of torture but if you think about what we would do to a laboratory animal 
or a laboratory specimen, you know, you don't look at it, I suppose, if you're dissecting a frog, this poor frog. I don't think that scientists look at it that way. That was the, the mode that they were in, that these, they were, they were uh, animals in a zoo. They were bacteria under a microscope. And the, these images that they're getting, some are uh, jubilant. Some are scary, some are terrifying, some are humiliating. For example, um, Elise had uh, been assaulted by, when she was a child by a man in a park. You know, obviously a terrifying, terrible experience that you'll always remember and a scar. She was made to relive that whole experience. Uh, the, the husband, Tom, was a football player, as I mentioned. So he has, like he's in a football field in a stadium where he played and people are cheering him. She has another uh, experience where she's, she's giving birth. But then she, she sees that the baby isn't there. She drifts into another room and she sees the baby surrounded by alien beings. And uh, just incredibly frightening. He is made to feel like he's the hunted, being a hunter. So he's being chased by hunters. He's shot, wounded. They track him down. They skin him. So from things that are like exalting to things that are humiliating to things that are downright terrifying. They put them through a, a, uh, a set of emotions, you know, no high to low, that, that just is mind racking, mind bending. This is, this is way heavier than I ever expected, man. Sorry. Way <laughs> heavier than I ever expected. It's the story. Well, I, and I understand that, and I think it leads to an uh, as we come to a close here in the first hour of the show tonight. Ron Felber is our guest, talking about the Mojave incident. I think it opens up a lot of questions, a lot of entertainment to what you're going to explain in the second half of mm -hmm. this encounter as we continue on. I mean, wow! I I don't know about anybody else out there, but I completely have goosebumps yeah. listening to Ron tell this story. Remember, there's no triple stars out there, people. If you see one, you got some serious aliens happening at that point. Really, really do. And uh, we're going to continue on here with Spaced Out Radio. Ron Felber is our guest tonight on the Mighty SOR. You can find all of his books on Amazon. He's got some great tr crime fighting uh, books as well as the Mojave Incident, which we are talking about tonight. Stay tuned. We're going to find out what happened to the Giffords in the Mojave Desert back in 1989 when we return on Spaced Out Radio. All right, my friend, I'm going to put your microphone on mute. I'm just going to step away and uh, grab some hot tea, okay? Sure, absolutely. I'll be okay, right I'm going to get some water. Thank you. In about six minutes. Six. Okay, fine. I'll be right back, audience. <clears throat>
All right. Now I know how long it takes to boil water. <laughs> Sorry about that. So you feeling a little better? Oh, I, I got my tea here. Yep. Good. Good. I do. Uh, hopefully it'll taste good. I don't think I mixed it very well, but that's all right. Uh, hi, Stevie Franchise. How you doing? Uh, gorgeous Marie, Auntie Entity. Welcome to our channel. Ross Smith. How you doing? Uh, the lovely Jennifer Hawkins. Good to see you. Grady Strickland. Nice to have you back. Aunt Linda. What's happening? And uh, we're going to get going here in 20 seconds. Thank you to everybody in the super chat. We really appreciate the love and support. That's a good way to support what we do. Thank you to all the veterans out there tuning us in. We really appreciate it. And I apologize. I'm not feeling very well. That's okay. Here we go. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Here we go with hour number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. We want to say hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam is at the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Salma Gundy. Salma Gundy is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as a clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website spacedoutradio.com we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to bumblefoot and reading out on captain shirks sor newswire check out our swag as well follow us on twitter at spaced out radio and on instagram spaced out radio show we continue on tonight with ron felber the mojave incident if you missed the first hour of the show especially the last half hour wow it's going to freak you out. And his book called The Mojave Incident can be found on Amazon with his others. Ron, welcome back. Good to be back. All right. Now, right before the break, we were talking about aliens starting to surround the camper. And things are getting weird and they can't move. They're trapped by these electric beings. And, oh, man, I'm just pumped right up here. Take us through the second part of this, man. Sure. Uh, it's... Uh... It's, it's no less intense. <laughs> so the illuminated beings, which I've described as, uh, um, you know, raven black eyes, not eyes like yours or mine, uh, no, no pupils, uh, spindly body, uh, maybe the torso of a five-year-old or so, but bright white light, uh, brighter than anything they'd see. Nine of them surround the camper. They're trapped. He has a gun across his his legs, which he can't use. There are two monitors, electronic mo electric monitors. So if he moves forward, he gets a tremendous shock from them. So really, they are trapped. At the same time, and this is almost like an orchestration. Like I said, there's sort of a universe of reality exposed. This searcher, this triangular uh, craft, is combing the desert, apparently looking for something, looking for maybe rare earth metals, like it's mining. They hear around this time with the mothership capping them, these gremlin creatures, you know, frenetic, uh, climbing on the, on the camper, climbing in the trees, hundreds of them. Uh, they, they are getting memories, some good, some incredibly terrifying and some altered to be terrifying uh, in their minds like mind shattering things, things about maybe uh, being accosted, somebody, the woman, Elise being accosted as a child, uh, um, other, other memories uh, like uh, hunting in the woods with his father and brother, this would be Tom, but other things where he's being hunted. And so, it, and, and, and actually shot and skinned. So these things are, are made, it seems to emote emotions, fear, uh, exultation, uh, laughter, uh, all of the emotions, the range of emotions that humans experience. So literally, 
they're in the in the in the camper sobbing laughing uh, it, it's and you know they're each going through their their situations um and it seems like these illuminated figures are scientists and they're, and they're, they're probing their minds to find out how human emotions work because apparently that's something that uh, later on she finds out that, it, that and we find out that that's something that, that is of great interest to them, the way the human mind works and emotions. The mining operation that I mentioned was going on continues, but now they get an odor, uh, an odor like phosphorus or sulfur or rubber burning, a very heavy odor. And they can feel a drill, like a drilling shaking the earth around them in the meantime the the mother ship has has a a uh, a beam that's shot down about 100 feet in diameter sucking things up into the craft as i mentioned uh, trees uh, animals um, cactus anything that's there that's of interest and uh they're terrified their hearts are pounding and uh they think they're going to have heart attacks so they're really on the verge of a cardiac arrest and they know it. And uh, then a kind of fog comes in, a kind of fog comes into the camper, which uh, is a kind of anesthesia, I guess. But basically what it does is calm them down. Physically and mentally, it calms them down. They're still terrified, but they're not so terrified that they're gonna die of a heart attack. And, and the insidious part of this it isn't because they have some pity. It's because they want to keep them alive to experiment more. So you, if you think about a laboratory animal being experimented on a science by a scientist, the scientist doesn't say, gee, I wonder if this animal has uh, offspring. I wonder what this animal's life was like. No, no. They're interested in the lung. They're interested in the, the kidney. They're interested in the brain. They're in, interested in the reproductive systems. That's what this was like. That's what this was like. So basically, uh, they're, they're, they're terrified. They're in the back. All of these things, these, this tremendous orchestration of things is going on around them. Now they're a little bit more calmed down, and they see these things start to recede. And just as they think, my God, you know, they're going away they come back again in force. And again, it's almost like to find out how they react to one thing versus the other. Um, so again, they feel like they, they feel like they're in hell. They feel like they died and are in hell. That's, that's what they're thinking. That's what they said they're thinking. Actually, I could read a quote. Do you mind? Please, From, go, yeah. please go right ahead. Um, let's see what it is. Here. They wanted everything we had, everything, our minds, our bodies, even our souls. It was like they drew it out of us with a syringe, every molecule, and it was painful. And I thought we were going to die or had already died and were being tortured in hell. That comes from Elise Griffith during a, a, one of the recording sessions I had with him. So the trauma is, is more than you could imagine and intense. Now, this is what I mean about an orchestration. They see then, as again, they they're, uh, think they've lost their minds and probably on the verge of losing their minds. They see an angelic presence come from the clouds, a feminine presence. They could feel that. They called it their comforter. And it's an angel, like a, a, an angel has descended. The message they get is, it's going to be all right. This will be over. You will survive. They thought their kids were in jeopardy at, at the home. Yeah. yeah, and this is what I was wondering. Where are the children at this time? Because they have two young ones. Yeah, they're being watched by uh, by the grandparents, by uh, Tom's uh, father and mother at, at the residence in uh, La Mirada. Okay. Yeah. So uh, all of a sudden, I, I was having like a panic attack there. <laughs> the children were in the were in the camper as well. Uh, they, they wind up in being involved, but not in the camper. Oh so, my! Uh, so this angelic presence is really of interest to me 
because I mean, you can take this from a lot of angles, this, this sort of story. The fact that there's an angelic presence that says everything will be all right, a comforter and whatnot, is almost religious. I mean, it is a, a, a religious figure, you know, at least uh, stereotypically. Uh, the gremlins, you know, evil. I mean, for sure evil. The scientists. So, I mean, you could almost look at this as a kind of biblical story, some crazy biblical story, or you could look at it as some encounter of, of, of massive magnitude. So uh, they, they they now feel like they're they're sort of uh, pacified, uh, calmer, maybe even drugged, and uh, they feel the earth shaking from this mining operation, and they see the the probe is with the hundred foot diameter of light it's sucking things up start to bring the camper up and that's all they remember they wake up the next morning the campfire is out so obviously time has gone by um it's the morning um they think they think this is what they think because of the times i suppose they think the russians have, have dropped bombs. They think this is the end of the world. Maybe in a theological sense, you know, angels, devils, all like that. Or maybe it's just the military, you know, at the, the end of the world has come. That's what they th they're thinking. And they're thinking that every broadcast, if they can get a broadcast on the radio, will be about this. They turn on the radio expecting to hear about this incredible situation. I think it's global. And uh, there's not a word about it. You know, there's a country western song playing and and that's it. They start to leave and uh, of course they're incredibly shaken. There's a, an elderly couple that's, you know, uh, more towards the campsite, but at least closer to where they were. They said, did you see anything last night? Because they're, they're really reluctant to say what they saw. And the older couple says, you know, we didn't see anything. We went to bed pretty early, so we didn't see anything. They go home, and uh, it doesn't end there. Um, they're plagued with uh, horrible nightmares. Um, some of them where they're surrounded, their bed is surrounded by these alien creatures. Uh, some where where their son, uh, Tom Jr., is uh, about four years old. And he has his own room. And uh, they hear him screaming. So they come out, run into his room, and he's spinning like a top. Spinning like a top. So, so Elise grabs him, hugs him, and she, he's inconsolable. He says, they're monsters. You know, there are monsters in my room. And uh, she says, there are no monsters. And he says, oh, there are. They're little and they have red eyes. <laughs> now, I... now she's angry. She starts screaming, you know, you can do what you want to us. But leave my children alone. Leave my children out of this. And... Uh, they have flashbacks and the, in these flashbacks, for example, they, they, they have memories, uh, Tom, of fighting, of fighting these, these beings, like going on a, a kind of, uh, you know, in airports, they have that, that, uh, that walk thing where you walk and it pushes you forward. I can't recall what they call it, yeah. but he, he feels like he's on that battling these creatures in his nightmares, uh, she feels like the bed, like they're making love and the bed is surrounded by these things. And uh, she goes, you know, he had no intention of, of, of having sex that, that night, neither did he, but they did. And she looks at uh, her husband and says, uh, I'm pregnant. And he goes, you know, that's unlikely. He goes, no, I'm pregnant. I know it. And they felt all the while that these things were watching them, watching them in their own home. And so every creek in the wood, every 
every clank in a radiator, you know, really has meaning to them. It really is upsetting them. And, uh, and they're beside themselves and uh, probably, I mean, neurotic wouldn't cover the base, you know, something much, much more than that. Maybe a lot like um, what war veterans come back with. And that's what one of the doctors that I took them to, a PDS or whatever. PTSD. Yeah, that uh, PTSD, that that's what they were suffering from. Like war veterans, people that had seen atrocities in combat. That's what, when he examined them, that's what they were suffering from. Um, so, so, uh, this is where I stepped in. This is where I came into the picture. So they're, you know, in a frenzy, they, they have no interest. Tom all of a sudden has no interest in going to work. He just is lethargic. Uh, she is panicked that, that these things are in her house and they're watching them. They always feel like they're being watched. So it's a kind of hell on earth for both of them. Like after you've experienced that, let's just say it happened to you, you know, building a shopping mall is not high on your list of things to do. It's, you know, this is like catastrophic or it's, it's uh, you know, a major event in human history. And it pales, you know, anything beside it, you know, pales by comparison. So that's the state they were in when I met them. And uh, my friend, Paul Moran introduced me to them, and this would, would have been Tom's best friend. And uh, um, I, I heard this story. I taped it, you know, because I wanted the real words to use for the book, you know, real dialogue. And some of the dialogue is, is incredible. But um, uh, that's where I stepped in. And I said to myself, you know, look, this is something important. Now, not every person is going to think it's important because, as we discussed earlier, a lot of people are just oblivious to all of this. And no matter what you did, you know, no matter what you showed them, it wouldn't convince them. You know, it, it would, you know, if there was some alien that appeared, they'd say, oh, it was a fake. You know, it was doctored or this wasn't real or I, I had a bad night last night and, you know, I was whatever. So sort of the non-believers probably will stay non-believers and the believers will stay believers. But um, I became a believer in what they said. And I decided that if I was going to do this, because it was important, I didn't care what I had to spend. I wanted to take them to the best uh, psychiatrist that I knew of. And that would have been um, at the uh, Washington Institute of uh, Psychiatric of Study of Psychiatric Disorders. And that would have been a Dr. Vitone, a Georgetown University uh, uh, graduate, medical school graduate, who checked them out uh, for two days. They took all kinds of tests and they were as anxious to do this as I was because they wanted answers. They didn't know what happened to them after they, were, they, they felt the, the camper coming up uh, towards the, the, uh, the mother craft. So he tested them. Uh, all the standard uh, psychiatric tests, he came back, he said, you know, these are very normal people, a little more intelligent than most, etc., but normal. I, I would like to ask a question, if you don't mind. When you approached the, the psychiatrist for the psychiatric evaluation of the Giffords, a lot of psychiatrists do not believe in this phenomena. How did you approach the subject about saying, look, these people have had something extraordinary happen. Did you keep it vague? Did you tell him what happened? Or did you just let him figure it out on his own? I, I told him. I didn't tell him the story as in an elaborate fashion that I'm discussing it now. But I gave him the, the spine of the story, let's say. And I just said his name was Bernard Vitone, Dr. Bernard Vitone. I said Bernie because I knew him from Georgetown. I said, Bernie, this is a, a really an incredible account it's not a story it's an account and uh i think you'll want to get to the bottom of this as well so i want to include you in this and i i know that you could be a key element in in telling us is this some fantasy evaluate them are they neurotic are they psychotic are they prone to fantasy what what who are these people psychologically and uh, that's how i approached it and 
both doctors that I, I worked with um, took it on as a kind of challenge. They didn't laugh. I mean, these are guys that see a lot of things. One was an FBI retrogressive hypnotist and, and psychologist. And the other, you know, was heading up a, a psychiatric uh, disorder clinic, uh, the National Center. So they've seen a lot of things in their lifetime, I'm sure. And so they were curious, I'd say, curious. How did the Giffords feel about going to a psychiatrist to see if they were just playing loco and losing it or that this was a real experience. Did they Were they worried about any bias towards their experience? Or well, they game? were very concerned about the, their perception. That's why they didn't want anyone to know. I mean, he, he, he felt like he'd lose his job if he told anybody about this. Um, she felt like she'd lose her friends if anybody, you know, you know, the story is a fantastic one. And to, the both it's fantastic and it's fantastic, but to, to tell somebody cold, this is what happened to me, they're, they're just going to move away. They're, they're just going to move away. And so they were really concerned about that. As far as being examined by these doctors, you know, I told them their credentials. I showed them their credentials, which are really substantial. And, um, you know, they're really experts, national experts in their field. And they were they wanted to find out they're having these bone crushing nightmares, you know, that, that just they can't sleep. They they can't eat. They have no interest in anything. They're just you know surviving. So they wanted to find out what what happened themselves. So they were um, I won't say anxious. I mean I have to say that Elise was was less uh, enthusiastic, let's say, than her husband. But uh, they did it because they couldn't live without knowing what happened. Mm -hmm. What, what did the results say from the psychiatric assessment? Yeah. Um, we, got, we got 90 seconds. Yeah, it, it, it came out that, that really these were responsible people, that they were a little above average intelligence, that um, you know they, their cognitive abilities were good, that they uh, had no brain dysfunction, physical brain dysfunction, that they were not prone to fantasy. As a matter of fact, uh, Tom was just the opposite, really a bread and butter, stone by stone kind of guy. So, uh, you know, this added tremendously. They took a lie detector test as well, passed with flying colors. So it makes it more credible to me. You know, that's, that's how I felt. Did it make the Giffords feel more comfortable to know that they weren't psychotic, that they weren't happy? You, you know? know they almost cried. Elise almost cried. She goes, it's so good to know that we're not crazy. You know, they questioned themselves, you know. They were I, happy about the result. And I think that's what a lot of people forget in all of this, is the people who are experiencing the this phenomena, they're more critical on themselves than anybody, any scientist or any doctor so. or any critic could be. Yeah. Yeah, they have nothing to gain and everything to lose. And so I, I felt flattered that they trusted me enough with the story. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. We're going to continue with the story because there are so many questions, Ron, uh, when we come back. I mean, from the children to I know our audience has some questions built up for you, and we'll get them to uh, ask those questions in the chat room as well when we come back. I mean, this is just an absolutely incredible true story called the Mojave incident by Ron Felber. And I'm telling you, you want this book for your library. This is a good one. It can be found on Amazon. Ron promises his mustache will autograph the book. <laughs> it's a great lip blade. We'll be back on Spaced Out Radio right after this. I'm not going to lie. I'm very jealous of your mustache. I can't. <laughs> no, it, it's not that good in person. It just does well over these, uh, these um, oh, telecasts. Sure, sure. sure. <laughs> <clears throat> so how much time do we have now? What, what's we have five time? minutes. We have oh, five, five minutes. minutes. Yeah, good. I think it's going well. I hope you agree. Oh, my friend. I am just in thrill. I love stories like this. 
Well, if if I could do stories like this nightly, it would be incredible. Yeah, you you should wait till we get to the hypnotic sessions. I mean, not only does it get, provide questions, it provides answers, and that's yeah. really unusual. Yeah, I wish <laughs> everybody has questions. Not too many people have answers, right? <laughs> well, I think that's why we all we're all tuned in is we all want answers for everything, you know. We all want answers. Well, I think this is a glimpse, really a glimpse into 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 some truth. That's what I think. Uh, now, are is the Giffords the real name, or did no, you no. dispute him? No, that's why I stumbled once or twice on the first names. Ah, it, gotcha. Yeah. I didn't even catch it. Yeah, it's Stephen Dawn Hess. Is that really yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now for them, for the Giffords, we'll call them the Giffords. Yes. Um, for them, do they, um, are, are they completely out of it? Are they still having experiences? You know, I, I, I've talked to them since, uh, but maybe, you know, this is over time and you know, just things change your life changes. Everything changes over in over 10 years or, or longer. Um, I kept in touch with them. And uh, we did a couple of talk shows together. Um, they 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 proceeded in their lives and tried to bury this pretty much, meaning they don't. This is not something they really want to talk about. Right. They, they became devout Mormons, and they moved to uh, Utah. And um, their bishop's interpretation of this was a theological one, a biblical one. Wow. Yeah. Which, by the way, I don't discount. You know, the, the thing about this is, you know it happened, okay? You know what happened. But then you say, what does it mean? You know, what does it mean? Uh, what, 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 what am I take, catching a glimpse of exactly, you know? I think every experiencer, myself included, wants to know that. What yeah. does it mean? Why me? Yeah. You know? I mean, I started a nightly radio show over it. Mm. Right? I mean. So you're so, going to talk about your encounter or, or is no. that something? Yeah. Uh, I'll fill you in privately. They, I've, I've, I've said it too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Years. Now, their, their children would be in their early 30s, late 20s, early 30s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As, as far as I know, they, they have productive lives. And, I, you know, I, I don't know. The, like, you know, this was a glimpse inside them, too. Yeah. I mean, they're giving a glimpse into their soul. That doesn't happen often. And if it does happen, it doesn't happen for long. Yeah. That, so over time, our relationship became I'm the author, the, the, the subject of, of, the, of the book, rather than, you know, uh, this is what I'm feeling. This is, you know, what's happened to me last night. Yeah. That, you know, that, that situation, you know, just ran its course. Yeah, I mean, I think every experiencer who has woken up on the table or or found marks on them or or whatever, I think we all kind of want to know what is up. I, I think we really do. And I'm a firm believer, and I don't know. I'm being. I'll put some tin foil on my head here mm -hmm. when I say this, but I'm a firm believer that there are parts of government agencies in the world that actually know who's been taken and who hasn't. I really do believe that. Yep. Yep. I think that's uh, entirely possible. I have some sections, if, if, if it's okay to read, which is real yeah. dialogue from the tapes, which mm -hmm. are, is really uh, kind of incredible. Yeah, please. I would mm -hmm. love you to. Good. We have about 45 seconds. I want to say a big thank you to Chad, Spooky, Flash Forward, Jenny on her birthday, uh, Kira, Sally, Dirt, uh, Dirt Road, uh, Murray, Space Cow, and Cat Chaser for the amazing Super Chats. It's a great way to support what we do on a nightly basis here on the show. So thank you so much. Thank you to all the veterans who are tuning on in. You always have a safe home here on Spaced Out Radio. So thank you for joining us. We really do appreciate it. And, of course, all our regulars who are here. <coughs> Excuse me. We appreciate you as well. Don't forget, you can get all of your SOR swag. Go to our website, spacedoutradio.com forward slash shop. 
We got t-shirts, hoodies, everything you can imagine hanging on out. Here we go. We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Really appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Reminder, all of our archives are free. All you got to do is go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Check out our swag, rock out to Bumblefoot, read up on Shirky Poo's Newswire, follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with author Ron Felber, The Mojave Incident. If you have missed portions of this show, I'm telling you, you're going to want to rewind this one and check it on out about the Gifford family being abducted by extraterrestrials in the Mojave Desert. They get home, find out that their son, is being visited by monsters with little red beady eyes. Ron, welcome back. Yeah, good to be back. You know, if it's, if it's okay, Dave, we, we've had a lot of questions, I'm sure, that come up. But I, I, made, I have some actual answers that, that come out of these interviews, which are, are pretty stunning. But I, I wanted to start with that. We mentioned that they felt like they were being watched. So here's yeah. this comes directly from the tapes. So... Uh, it's about four weeks after their encounter. And Tom, the husband, is having nightmares. And he thinks he sees like several beings around their bed. Then uh, the vision is gone and there's just one remaining. And this is from the tapes. The being is four feet tall. He wears a white luminous uniform with an upturned arrow on the chest. He has no facial features, no mouth or lips, only slits. He passes directly through the wall. He stands behind the headboard. He stays there, passes his three long fingers over Elise's face, over and over. Tom can only see the hand. He opens his eyes and directly above him is the face of the white being. You're dreaming, he hears the voice say. Then he looks to Elise's face and sees the burn marks its fingers have left. Hey, wait a minute, Tom says aloud. This is no dream. He turned to Elise and gasped. He was awake. He knew he was awake, and Elise had the burn marks all over her face. Elise's eyes open. The expression on Tom's face scares her. What? What is it? Go to the mirror, he urges her. Go to the mirror now. Elise walked to the wall mirror above the chiffonier. My God, what is this? She screamed. Tom, Tom, what have they done? They've burned my face. That's all right, he said, and uh, holding her close to him. It's going to be okay. He eased away from her. Now you just stay right here, sweetheart, while I go to get a camera. He gets a camera, takes pictures. They're black when he he takes them, uh, so they they don't come out at all. And the next morning, the burn marks are gone. But this is the kind of torture that that they're experiencing, and it's no small thing. I had that happen once. Is that true? Not with burns, but with scratches on my back. I woke up. I woke up one night, and or one morning, and my partner says to me, "What are those scratches on your back?" I had two scratches about four or five inches long, about an inch apart, and they were stutter scratches. You know how like how a cat scratches? Yeah, it's stutter scratches. And I said, I remember saying, I got to get a picture of this. I have no right. idea what happened. You know, mm-hmm. I go to the bathroom, I do my thing, I walk, f- totally forget, walk out, eat breakfast, you know, start my day. Four hours later, I remember that I forgot to take the picture of the scratches, walk back into my bedroom, turn my back, position my phone, scratches are gone. Yeah. Not even a mark. Yeah. No scarring, nothing. It's amazing. It's terrifying. Yeah. It you feel, feel violated. I'm sure you feel violated, you know? At times. I just yeah. want to know what's going on, much All like right. everybody else. I'm, I'm going to see if we we can All right. some, some answers forward. Here we go. So this is Elise and Tom. Now, I brought them to a Dr. William Annixter, 
and he's in uh, Ash, Asheville, North Carolina. And uh, he was a former FBI retrogressive hypnotist he, and a psychiatrist. He would do that. So if there were, I don't know, a terrorist bombing or something, he would, and interview witnesses, they don't remember because of the trauma. The hip, hypnosis would, would get information out of them. So th they're hypnotized now. I'm in the room and uh, the doctor and Tom and Elise. So Dr. Anner, Anner, Annexer turned in his seat toward Elise, who sat with her body lax, head tilted to one side, lying on her right shoulder. Elise, do you have any idea what these beings want or why they're here? It was macabre watching as Elise sprang up in her chair, suddenly animated and alert. Her voice, rather than soft and emotional, took on a new cadence, which was clipped and direct, quite unlike her. They want to make contact with the population. Tom and I are specimens, imperfect like the human race. When we're ready to communicate with them face to face, then possibly the world will be too. Her actions, such as edging forward in her chair at the moment, seem mechanical, as did her voice as she continued. They have to study our reactions so they know how to approach us. They don't have emotions like ours, so they need us to teach them. They need to understand humans. Do you have some sense, this is the doctor, do you have some sense as to who they are and where they've come from? This is Elise. There are five galaxies. Theirs is the next closest. In order for all five galaxies to work together one day, they have to start and they're starting with us. So we'll be united galaxies. What else do you know? The doctor asked, feeling as if he was in contact with someone other than Elise. I know where the universe ends, she said, rattling the words off in staccato fashion, like round from a machine gun. Is that something you can put into words? Now there was no denying something incredible was happening. Elise says, our universe ends where theirs begins. Our universe ends when all its matter stops mattering to us and starts mattering to them. Everyone in the room looked to one another, stunned at what they heard and what they were seeing. I think that that's an incredible statement. I'll read it again because it's complicated. And, and can you imagine somebody just rattling this off? So it's, al it's almost like she was channeling that answer. Yeah, that, exactly. Our universe ends where theirs begins. Our universe ends when all its matter stops mattering to us and starts mattering to them. When we stop caring about what we're doing, when we stop caring about the earth, they'll start caring about the earth. Wow. <laughs> that's what I said. I, I mean, that you know what, though? That's pretty profound it's considering... Profound. When, when you look at a lot of other experiencers out there, a lot of the downloads and information they seem to get from extraterrestrials is, is about the planet and the state of the planet and how we're treating the planet like, exactly. like our, our own wasteland. Exactly. You know, I mean, so the fact that they're saying our, our galaxy ends where theirs begins yeah. is when we start treating it better. So that actually makes sense. Yeah, it, does. it makes a lot of sense. It's like you say, profound. And stated in almost Shakespearean terms. I mean, that's a turn of words and turn of meanings. It's very complicated, you know. Yeah, that's that's why I'm saying it. It sounded like she was channeling that, not not being regressed, but actually it, channeling. It felt that way. So, if you want to, I'll go on with some yeah, of the please, the, please do. So, the doctor says, if these beings are in contact with you, tell me what you know about them. Now, this is where it gets almost theological. God created our world in his image, but not theirs or any of the others. The doctor, are there many different kinds of beings? Elise, yes, different ones, different hybrids. When do you think this communication will happen between the aliens and humans? I don't know. In my lifetime, how long will you live? The hairs on the back of my neck raised in a normal man's lifetime. Our children's, she said at last. It was then that I heard the had the distinct feeling that I was in a chess match of words. 
Elise had begun to take satisfaction in the cleverness and the sharpness of her responses. Are we watched as a population regularly? Yes, by many different kinds of beings sent on a mission from the one supreme. What does that mean? There's one supreme being that controls all of them. He sends missions here. They're not here of their own accord. This is like a president or like a god. What else do you know about the one supreme? The being could care less. The beings could care less if they were here or not. They're just following orders. I was thinking then, where do I take this from here, you know? So you talk about the universe and matter earlier. You said our universe ends where theirs begins, and then she picks it up. Our universe ends when its matter stops mattering to us and starts mattering to them. I reflected briefly on what Tom had said concerning their intervention into our world if war or mass destruction seemed imminent. What does that mean? I don't know. The missions these aliens are on are friendly or unfriendly. They're neutral. They could care less. What does the one Supreme want? For all the galaxies to live harmoniously together. Do we have a separate God from the one Supreme? No. What else do you know about this entity? Is it, is it a being like the others? Read the Bible. I know. <laughs> Read the Bible. Yeah, that's what she says. I don't see anybody, and maybe it's just me. Uh huh. I don't see anybody under hypnosis saying that. I, I, it, was, I, 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 it just yeah. sounds too contrived. You know what but, I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I still think she was channeling. Yeah, I don't think it was contrived. I mean, it sounds like it wasn't her. I, I'll grant you that. I'm, none of this sounded like it was her. I mean, you know somebody after you interview them for two years. And, you know, when I saw this this person hypnotized, this was like, you know, sitting forward in a chair, very clipped language, very clever sort of language. You know, that w when, when will they appear? Will they appear in my lifetime? How long are you going to live? I mean, that's not, you know, the, the normal dialogue. Were you sitting in on this? Oh, yeah, I was asking some questions. At some point in time, I asked the, the doctor, Dr. Annixter, if I could ask them questions. And he said, yes. So I did. Question from Big Willie, who has a fantastic beard, by the way. Without telling us if you guys are not comfortable, that's fine. Have they ever come to a conclusion about their daughter's origins then? Yeah, that's really a good question. And um, actually, I was talking to Dave about something like that. We, they really, frankly, this is, this is what happened. They uh, became very religious. I mean, the, the comfort that drove them was religion. That's what they flew to, I guess, as a kind of comfort. And uh, they became Mormons and moved to, uh, to uh, the Salt Lake City area. And um, they talked to their bishop who suggested they not discuss this with anyone or, or their personal matters publicly. And also told them that uh, what they witnessed was, uh, was um, uh, devils and angels, and that it was a, uh, a religious experience that they, they had. That's, that's, so they, they, what happened to the, the child really is not something that I had access to. Mm-hmm. Well, at least you were you were in there firsthand watching them go through this. What caught you off guard by their uh, their regression? The the directness of their answers. As I mentioned, you know, there's, everybody has questions about all of this, but these are pretty much answers. When is this going to happen in your children's lifetime? When are they, when is this major encounter? That's a pretty direct answer. You know, what is their mission to unite these five galaxies? That's a pretty direct answer. You know, who is the one supreme? Is it like kind of a president, like a god? And she says that like, like a god, like not, not emphatically, let's say. So Kaiju is asking, I was going to ask this as well. Was there any kind of government involvement in this case? No, absolutely not. No, I mean... 
you know, it, it's just so amazing. If something happened to you, let's say the craziest thing in the world, I don't know, make it up. And you went to, I don't know who, the police? I mean, who do you go to, the mayor of the town? You go to the governor? I mean, they're, they're just not going to believe you. Right. And so the government, no, the government had no involvement with the case. And if uh, if they did know anything, and it's almost unimaginable that with the scope of all of this, that that someone didn't know, whether it's radar or this or that, there were military bases, you know, not so far from uh, from where they this happened. You know, they they are in the Mojave and there are some uh, military bases. You'd have to think that a lot like, you know, the, the, the sightings that you see or hear about that the Pentagon just released, that there, there were radar, uh, that they were on radar, that there were there were blips that could be seen. But if there were, they sure weren't going to tell me about it. <laughs> All right. So as, as you continue on here, are they still having experiences? Do we? I, I don't. I don't. My my impression and my belief is that this never goes away. This is something you just live with. Like for example, I mentioned it's like a veteran coming back from you know a horrendous experience in in the war. You know, or maybe you watch your, your friends murdered and blown up and this and that, just, you know, atrocities. And they come back and they, they don't talk about it. You know, this is something they just keep inside, but it doesn't go away. You know? Very true. Very true. At, at any point, Ron, and we're going to get back into the story here momentarily as we've got about seven minutes to go. At any point, did did they feel like they were you know, being your personal guinea pigs towards trying to figure out what, go, what was going on? Or did or did they just go with the flow with you because they wanted to know what was happening and you were providing professional people for them? I think that, um, I think that certainly initially they were just in a quandary. So he couldn't work, she couldn't eat, they couldn't sleep at night. And these are all, you know, symptomatic of, of, of traumatic a traumatic cas- catastrophe that that they experienced so that that makes all kinds of sense and they were looking for answers too at that time when i first met them there were there was a half the story half of the story that was missing you know, they didn't know they were just having flashbacks to to certain elements of the story so they wanted to know too and so i don't think they thought i was exploiting them i think you know we became, you know, friendly and friends, I suppose. And uh, I don't think they thought that. But I will say this. Over time, and I think, you know, basically uh, other people, maybe the bishop from this church, was, was really more for keeping this to yourself. This is a personal experience, an encounter that you had. This isn't for, you know, to make movies about or, or this or that. And, and around that time, uh, I would say that our communication became uh, less frequent. Does that bother you that it went that way? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it always bothers somebody if you know you have a friend or friends, and all of a sudden, you know, or even over time, if uh, you're still, you know, in that mode to be friends, and and all of a sudden they turn sort of cold. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think so. Going back to when they were in the in the the desert that night, did they know what happened with anything that was being pulled off the surface, like the cactuses or the rocks or anything? It, it, the- to them, it looked absolutely undisturbed. The campfire was out; um, their clothes were a little tasseled, um, and I think I think basically they were in a state of shock. They were more interested. As opposed to, but they did go back. I should tell you that. But they were more interested in, um, I guess, first of all, getting away. Second of all, like I mentioned, they thought it was the end of the world. They thought, you know, some atomic bomb had gone off or some huge event had happened, and they wanted to know about it. So the first thing they did was look at, go to the radio. Like, what did we? You know, everybody must have experienced this. It was too big for just us to have experienced it. And uh, so I think that's the first thing they did. Uh, so uh, I don't think they inspected things, but my guess is that if they did, 
uh, it would be like the scratch marks you talked about or the burn marks uh, with Elise. It would be normal. Right. I mean, that just doesn't make sense. we got about three and a half minutes here before we have to go to break. At the top of the hour, Ron Felber, the Mojave incident is what we are discussing tonight. Ron, I, I mean, you talked a little bit about the children. You know, they are now fully adult. Do we know if they are still having experiences? I, I, I can't say, but again, I can I can speculate. And uh, I think I think they've they've done the best they can to keep this to themselves. Now they did share the book with their their kids. They they had to, you know, uh, because of you know this is can't be a secret, and they didn't want it to be a secret. And uh, I think I think from all all of their points of view, they've just learned to live with it. Now, do they still have nightmares? Do they still feel like they're being watched? Yes. Hmm. Yeah. Up till two years later, and I know that they were they were still feeling this um, this sense of being watched. As a matter of fact, Tom has a, a quote about that. Let me see if I can find it quickly. Just bear with me a second, please. Yeah. Yeah. No, no problem. Yeah. He goes. She goes. Um, talking about them in terms of whether they're evil or what they are. Here we go, right? I'm going to get this. Here. Here's what he says, and this is a direct quote. Do you know what it's like to want to protect your family every day and every night and know that you can't even protect yourself? Because whether you see them or not, you can feel them, and it's like they live inside you inside your brain and they can do whatever they want when they want. And there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Tom Gifford. I mean, I think that sums it up. I think that, that tells you, I mean, it's like inside them. Yeah. I, I mean, this is something that I would assume and granted on assumption only that they are still having those type of experiences. It just, I would too. And what they're doing is, I think they're hiding behind their Mormonism now, in uh, order, in order yeah. to try and, you know, maybe relinquish some of that fear or or whatever it may be. You know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's the feeling that I have. I mean, I could be completely wrong. What do they think about you still going around after all these years talking about this story? I, I think they know that you know I'm a writer. They knew, knew you know that that's what I do, and they know that this is what I do. So I, I don't think they have a problem with it. I think uh, I think if they had a preference, this would all stay like right from the beginning. This is not something they really wanted to share. But they were involved in the book. They saw the book well before it was published, etc. So it wasn't like I just did it. But I think uh, particularly since they. Uh, they uh, were counseled, were counseled. I think that uh, they would probably prefer that, that this not be speculated. And actually, I don't use the real names for that reason. Right. And, and you know, I, I'm just, I think this is one of those stories, though, that needs to be told. Um, has Hollywood, as we got about 20 seconds left, has Hollywood ever called about this? Uh, I had some interest in it, and uh, I've done some other things. Uh, some of my books have been TV shows, and one of them is being filmed now. That's a nonfiction book. There's been some uh, um, interest in it, but no, uh, it, it hasn't sold to the movies or to a television. But Paranormal Witness did an hour right. segment on it. Right. All right. We have Ron Felber for another 30 minutes here on Spaced Out Radio. Going to continue the UFO talk. Where does he go from here? What else is going on? Then we have John Hudson, Shirky Poo's News, Thought of the Day, Hour 3 is next. This is just fantastic. Yeah, I have a quote that I'll read uh, from Norman Mail. It's just a short quote, but it sums up one of the possibilities. There are two possibilities that I see. One is these are extraterrestrial visitors and, and a lot of the biblical stories and whatnot have been misinterpretations 
misinterpretations of the, this events like this. Mm -hmm. The other is that there really is a one supreme, that the one supreme is God, and that uh, and that He is trying to unite the galaxies, and uh, in that sense, it's not a scientific but a religious sort of reality, you know, a spiritual reality versus a scientific one. And, you know, I could argue either case, particularly with the angel and particularly with her her comments about, you know, the one being, the one supreme and, and the rest. You know, it, it's like a, a kind of modern art. You look at it for a long time and you say, what do you make of this exactly? But it's there. You just have to say, what do I make of it? And I've come to the one or the other and you could flip a coin as far as I'm concerned. I don't know. Why have you, maybe I should ask this on air, but why have you since then stayed away from UFO books? Um, because I don't think there's another story like this. I think I, not to be pompous or whatever, I think I wrote the UFO book. I think this is the story. And I just don't think I could write a better book because I don't think I could ever find a better story. Interesting. I mean, I mean, this is a, this is a pretty good mm, rendering of what happened to these people. And it's, it's, it's prolonged. It's sustained. It's two people, not just one. It's two credible people who have passed through lie detector tests, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the story is fantastic, but the detail is incredible. The retrogressive hypnosis is incredible. Even the conscious experience. So you have experiences that are conscious and subconscious. There's no other story that I know of like this. It, and I, you know, I keep an eye out for all this. I just, I just think this is um, an important story and, and says more about what is really happening than anything I've seen. It's not because I wrote it. It's because of the story. Yeah. No, I, I could see that. I mean, in, in your mind, you found perfection in it, you know, and and I, 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 can, I guess uh, respectfully, I can totally understand the reason behind that. I, and I think that's, that's wonderful. I, I really do. But I just don't think I could do better. How about, you know, anything I did after this if it were another story or some compilation of stories, I just don't think I'll ever come across. And maybe I maybe, in, you know, at least at this stage of the game, I don't think there are many stories with the breadth and the, the, the like I said, it, the, a glimpse into another reality. Right. How Crazy, did, how <laughs> Crazy did this, stuff. <laughs> but how did this story change you? personally um well i i i first of all i, I believe in um that i believe that that there are extraterrestrials that that's beyond question for me but i also have to say and i, I struggle with the answer to this but i you know i i believe in life after death i believe in a spiritual world i believe that we have been watched for thousands of years you know since the creation of mankind I believe in some sense that's biblical. Do you know what I mean? In some yes. some weird perspective, that's the way it comes out on paper, you know, trying to capture these concepts that are so large. Um, so I think it's made me more spiritual. See, I, I would I would tend to agree with that, you know, going from my own personal. I, yeah. Like I've always had a, a, a big belief in God. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, I am, I'm different now, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't know how to explain that, but I feel more spiritual. I'm still God fearing, but I still feel more spiritually connected that I've gone down this road. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes all kinds of sense. <clears throat> all right. We have uh, about a minute to go here. 
I, I had a, a bit of an experience, nothing like this, nothing like your experience of this, but just uh, again, a, a tiny oh, one. Hold on to that. I'll, I'll ask that right off the bat. Okay. As we got about a minute here. And then I have this quote from Norman Mail that's only a couple of lines, but I think it, it's very profound. Absolutely. All right. Uh, big thank you to Chad, to Spooky, to Flash Forward, Jenny, Kira, Sally, Dirt Road, Murray, Space Cow, and Cat for the amazing Super Chats. It's a great way to support what we do. Another great way to support us is hit that subscribe button and ring that bell if you have it already. It helps us out. And you can do a little shopping, get your Spaced Out Radio swag on our website, spacedoutradio.com forward slash shop, because we'd love to see you in our gear. We really would. It's kind of cool when that happens. I get all giddy and childlike, and, mm-hmm. you know, fist pump and all that. Yeah. Thank you to all the veterans who listen to our show. We really do appreciate you. You always have a safe home here with us on our chat in our chat room and all our regulars. You guys are just the best. You make this so much fun nightly. Get your horns up. We're going to get rocking here in three seconds. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Here we go at the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. want to remind you that you can check us out on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on KPNL, TalkStream Live, and Revolution Radio. All of our archives are free. Just go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Selma Gundy. Samagundi is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR News Wire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, author Ron Felber is with us. The Mojave Incident. It's a book that can be found on Amazon and his website. And I'm telling you, this is a true story and of an amazing encounter that you don't want to miss. It's one you want to add to your library. Ron, welcome back. Good to be here. Have you personally ever had an experience? You know, I mean, nothing of the magnitude of the Giffords, nothing, anything like that, or or yours, but um, but I would be interested in getting retrogress because this I, I really I had a dream, and you know some dreams are just so vivid and so real to you, and this was the dream. I was living um near the beach at the time, and there was a pond near the the house where I was living, and in the dream I walked. Uh, the dog, our, our dog, and uh, we came to the uh, came to the pond. So I looked down into the pond, and maybe it was thirty feet deep or less than that, even. And uh, there was this this white object, this round object that was at the bottom of the pond. And this is a dream, but again, very vivid. And so I I, I said, hmm. Put the dog on a post and I jumped in, you know, which is really crazy, even in a dream, because the water is going to be pretty cold and it's not going to be a great experience. But as soon as I jumped in, I found myself in a, in this craft and there were beings a lot like the ones that we've described who took me around like for a tour, showed me equipment and showed me various instruments, you know, that were used. And the reason I remember this was that after that dream, and then I came back again, after that dream for a month, I was euphoric. I just had this incredible sense of euphoria, which I've never had before. And so I have to think that that dream meant something and was real in some way. And I, I believe that if I were retrogressed, there'd be a story behind that. 
Wow. Do you want to be retrogressed? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll figure that out. It's just been kind of hectic, but I'm gonna. I'm gonna do that for sure. During the break, you said something very profound as to why you haven't dipped back into the UFO world regarding stories and UFOs. You just do not think that there is another story out there like this. I'm very curious as to why you you feel that this is the perfect story for you to to um, kind of go through and and you know step away from it like a one and done situation hmm. yeah it, it, it isn't I, I i have not lost interest in this i watch every possible show on ufos and alien abductions i read every book so it's not like i've walked away from the, the subject but this is how i feel I, I just know i'll never come across another story like this my own view is that this is like i said almost like an orchestra you know, almost like a ballet or something on a large stage. You're seeing all of these things go on and it's like a glimpse into another reality. And not just a, not just through retrogressive hypnosis, half of it is brought out through retrogressive hypnosis. But you got to remember for four hours before that, these people were conscious, pinching themselves. You know, do you see what I see? Can this be real? Are we crazy? Are we in hell? So, so what you have is a huge scope and breadth. What you have are two credible people that have passed lie detector tests, that have been uh, analyzed by psychiatrists, that have been retrogressed. Um, and a story that, that answers things, doesn't just ask questions. When you ask, when, it, when it, is this encounter between humans and aliens going to happen? She says, in your child's lifetime. I and mean, that's a pretty direct answer. You know, who says he's the one supreme? Who is the one supreme? Is it like a president? Is it a, you know, an emperor? It's like a god. Why, why he wants to combine the five galaxies. He wants to have them live in harmony. And it brings up a quote, Dave, that I find really captures something. This is an old quote from 1992 on the David Frost show with Norman Mailer, the author who won a couple of Pulitzer Prizes and you know, people, many people consider a great, great writer. This is the quote and apply it to this story. The devil might be a presence from another universe. We might be fighting an implacable enemy out there and the devil might be the agent of the implacable enemy with God as the tired general fighting that war with his own agents of hope. Isn't that an incredible quote? When when Mrs. Gifford started quoting all of this, I know they are Mormon now, but were mm -hmm. they religious people? No, no, they were just, you know, not, not no, uh, no, they were, I wouldn't say they were anti-religion. They were just right. sort of, you know, people that believed in God, but uh, I don't, you know, not, not spiritual, not a member of any congregation or anything like that. Right. Okay. So the fact that they were uh, able to, this scared them enough. I, I, maybe that's the wrong term, but let's just say this scared them enough to, to turn towards religion, to find answers. Did you ever talk to them why they chose Mormonism over any other one? Um. No, I, I don't know the answer to that, except that I, I think that uh, they had a relationship or got a relationship, maybe were referred to a particular bishop that uh, that counseled them. And really, right. they counseled them and said this was, you know, as I mentioned before, I think there are two ways to look at this. Um, if, if you take the story at face value, one is that these are extraterrestrials and what you've seen is just a reality. And in former times, prophets, etc., misinterpreted all of this and gave it a, a tremendous religious right. connotation. And, and so it, it's either this or that. And to be honest with you, I, I don't know. I mean, there are things about it that certainly support what Mailer is talking about, this battle between good and evil. And then on the other hand, I mean, th these, these saucers and these 
these motherships, et cetera, these are physical things that have science and technology behind them. And so as a primitive, as we are, we see this stuff and say, you know, we don't understand it. It, it must be heaven sent or whatever. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I, I really don't know where to go with that. I mean, just the fact that it's, the fact that they were able through them to bring in the religious connotation, which doesn't happen with a lot of different uh, people who are abducted. Right. That's no, absolutely it. not. But, but still, I mean, it has elements and maybe it's like this. It, it depends. There's a guy wrote a book uh, it's called from what seat you're sitting you know, from where you're sitting. In other words, if you're sitting and seeing something and you're over here, you see it a certain way. If you're sitting over here from this particular seat, your belief system, you see it this way. Um, you know, if I had to, if I had to take a, um, you know, a guess at, at what the reality of it is, I mean, there's no saying that, uh, and, and by the way, they also say that these beings have been watching us for thousands of years. So my, my, guess would be that these are extraterrestrial creatures that they're more spiritual in nature than we realize that they've been here forever maybe since the beginning of humankind and that in some ways they they intercede now if you take that from a religious context you, know, you can make a, a case well they're angels they're devils they're this or that so it depends what seat you're looking at it from my own view is that that uh that there are other galaxies, that there are visitors, people that aliens that have visited our planet. I, I think I believe a lot in what uh, Francis Crick, who who founded the uh, double helix of DNA, got the Nobel right. Prize in Science. He believes in um, a direct transpermia, and right. what that is is that we're aliens. That at the end there was there's no. He said the the odds of evolution being true, meaning creating the human brain from a swamp and amoebas or whatever, is equivalent to having a tornado go through a junkyard, leave behind an assemble, assembled 747 jet that takes off and goes to Europe. He thinks that the time frames could not possibly be to create the human brain. He believes that meteors and asteroids were sent around the universe containing DNA, the DNA for human beings, which really was alien DNA. And that that DNA required, you know, far less time than an amoeba. You know, that basically the DNA for intelligence, the DNA for all of these things uh, was sort of pre-mixed and there to, 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 to uh, flourish. I, I believe that. I think that's a very reasonable theory. And that goes to the heart of a lot of this and sort of explains a lot of things. Maybe we're the children of aliens. It opens up such a Pandora's <laughs> box. I, I mean, with everything. And I look at ufology today and I see the dangers of opening up that Pandora's box to even more. When you hear this story and you hear the stories of other others that maybe aren't as detailed, do you really think now that you are a believer that the 7.8 billion people on this planet are very much ready for any sort of ET contact? I, I think that we're being acclimated. You know, if you look from the 40s to the 50s to the 60s to now, you've gone from some blurry pictures, you know, of, of a, something that looks like a saucer to really good films and videos to really credible people, law enforcement people, Ronald Reagan, Jimmy Carter, Fife Symington. You know, these are not irresponsible people that have seen UFOs and reported them. So then you talk about abductions, Be Betty and Barney Hill, and you talk about where we are now with millions, probably worldwide millions of people saying, I've been abducted. We're moving very close to what um, 
uh, Elise Gifford talked about, that in our children's lifetime, in our children's life, there will be an encounter, whether we're ready for it or not. But I think the time frame is really tightening. I talked to a source of mine a number of months ago who is very close to this UFO front on a government level. And I asked him the pertinent question, why now? Hmm. After four years uh, since the the whole movement with the New York Times article and everything, mm -hmm. I said, why now? And he said to me, he goes, why do you think? I said, well, I have two possibilities. Number one, we're in for a false flag invasion, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which could start a world war or, you know, start to make a lot of changes on the planet that we don't want to happen or have mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. I said, but I'm not really believing that. I said, number two, I said, I think that the United States government has been given a timeline. Huh. And I said, I, I strongly believe that. That one feels quite right mm -hmm. because there's no reason to open up this vault the last four years after 70 plus years of cover up. Mm -hmm. And he pretty much said, he goes, go with your gut feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, he goes, I can't tell you anymore. He goes, but if I were you, I would go with your gut feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Now, whether he's playing me or not because of his position, I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's an interesting question, but again, it, it fits, doesn't it? It fits into the timeline that of, of being, um, uh, you know, uh, acclimated to to the fact that there are aliens. I, even you take polls now. I mean, if you ask people, has the Earth been visited by aliens? You ask them in the 1940s. I, I bet five percent would say yes. If you ask them now, I'll bet you seventy percent. Maybe, you know, somewhere between 60 and 70 percent would say yes. That's, back, that's, that's quite, a, quite a, a leap. But back then, though, we were still a very religious society. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you're going back then where, I mean, mm -hmm. women were getting their, their bathing suits measured at the beach to make sure they were, weren't close to the knee. You know, yeah. because Lord knows the knee could sure turn a man on back in the day. Yeah. You know, I mean, but that's the reality of it. I mean, so do you think then that what we are seeing in ufology today is healthy for the public? Or do you see it as something that there is a narrative being played here? We got to watch out for whatever that narrative is. I think it's inevitable from a government's point of view. I mean, how, what do you do with cameras all over the place like we have now and didn't have? you know, video recorders, you know, cell phones that you can take photos of. Uh, I, I think that that the weight of just all of these people that have had experiences uh, becomes heavy. And I think at some point in time, it, the dam bursts and they, they at least let the water out slowly. But part of it is, okay, here are three or four videos recorded, you know, by jet fighter pilots. I mean, these, again, are not just frivolous people, you know? And I think we're, we're very near. So let's say in the next, um, I think in the next 50 years, within the next 50 years, that there will certainly be a, a human to alien encounter that's very open and very much real. Well, I, I'm hoping so. I just don't know, like I said, whether or not the public is ready. The public likes to talk tough. Mm -hmm. Everybody likes to talk tough on the internet. The majority of the people, even in ufology, are claiming, oh, we're ready for it. They've never had an experience on their own, Ron. Yeah. They don't know what it's like. Yeah. So I think there's that great debate that continues to go on. Uh, Kaiju has a question for you. How do you personally imagine the reveal to happen? Well, that's really a good question. <laughs> um. You know, I, I mentioned this before, you know, people say, well, you know, I'll believe in this when a spaceship lands on the White House lawn and a, an alien comes out and meets the president. That's when I'll believe this is true. 
I think something like that will happen. I think I think there'll be a major event. I don't think it'll be you know uh, thousands of UFOs or craft coming in some kind of takeover. I think it will be almost like a diplomat. And I could imagine a speech being given at the, the United Nations. It has to happen that way. I don't know another. That's the only way that you could avert. You know, if, if that happened and it were put out in, in the right way um, in, within the next 50 years. So imagine, you know, a lot will happen that acclimates us even more. But... I think, uh, I think the other thing that, that drives this is what, what Elise said. They'll start caring when we stop caring about the earth. And I think we're not far from saying we're not caring. Well, if you see the way we're treating our planet today, not to yeah. go all environmental, yeah, exactly. You see what the way we're treating our planet today, it's pr it's pretty obvious. Yeah. No, I mean Yeah. I I think that uh like I said maybe we're the we're the the offspring of uh, an alien civilization and this would go back to Frick's theory. Um and if we are, we're the children of these these uh beings. And if we're in a kind of brotherhood or childhood by, probably child by comparison, I think they probably care about humans and maybe they don't have emotions like ours. And maybe the reason they're studying emotions like ours is to make this communication happen in a way that doesn't totally freak out the world. Did you ever read a book by Philip Kraft uh, called, uh, Oh goodness. What's it called now about his uh, ET encounters with the Verdants? No, I haven't. Okay, Philip Kraft was uh, 34 years. He worked for the LA Times mm -hmm. and didn't believe in any of this, you know, and all of a sudden, one day, one weekend, his wife goes away and he gets taken for three days. Mm. And he has shown everything, including, which is very interesting to what you worked on uh, with this story, was about God. Mm-hmm. And these Verdans claim that they actually know where heaven is in the solar system. Wow. And they've been there. And and it's it's a great story. Uh, anybody wants to check it out. Philip passed away now. Uh, but he wrote this story in the late 90s, uh, going into the 2000s when the contact was supposed to be made. Then 9-11 happened and, and it, it screwed everything up regarding uh, the Verdance E.T. Con read. I'll, I'll take a look for it. Yeah, K-R-A-P-F is his last name. Kraf. Okay, I'll look yeah. for it. Do me a favor. We got 40 seconds left. Let everybody where, know where they can find the Mojave Incident and the rest of your books. Yeah, well, I have a website. It's uh, Ron Felber, F-E-L-B-E-R.com. It's pretty simple. Um, my books are on Amazon. They're on uh, Barnes & Noble. If you just go to the internet and put in Ron Felber, R-O-N-F-E-L-B-E-R, you'll see uh, you know, a lot of ways that, uh, that these books can be purchased, and particularly the Mojave incident, which really has been just people are fascinated by it, and it's been selling uh, you know, for quite a long time. Well, Ron, we appreciate you coming into Spaced Out Radio, and this was my first time interviewing you, and I, I'm just so impressed with your knowledge and your ability to, to tell us this story. Thank you so much. My we pleasure, Dave. Coming up next, we have John Hudson. He's got his fedora on. He's ready for the UFO report. We have Turkey Poo's News, Thought of the Day, a jam-packed third and final half hour of this show tonight. So stick around. Spaced Out Radio continues right after this. That was fantastic, my friend. A lot of fun. Hey, you that know, I've got a new book. I, I'm just, uh, it's finished, and I'm just in the process of uh, finding a publisher. I have four publishers interested, but uh, it's, it's a really interesting story. It came to me from Bill Blatty, William Peter Blatty from The Exorcist. Right. 
He gave me an account that happened in Boston at Harvard University, it was studied by Harvard University from 1898 to 1904. The great uh, psychologist William James was part of the team that examined this woman. And uh, it's a sort of a murder mystery with um, the paranormal written all through it. And really? uh, it's just an incredible true story. It's called The Unwelcomed, The Curious Case of Clara Fowler. Oh, if you want to come back on, man. I'd love to. We would actually like to get you on to talk some true crime stories that you've written, too. Sure. Yeah, whatever you say. I'm very interested. Yeah. I'll uh, I'll get my team to check in with you in a, in a couple of months. Yeah. Because we, we try and do like a four to five sure. month rotation, as you know. Sure. And then uh, we'll, we'll bring you back in to, uh, to uh, check it on out. Sounds great. Yeah, my friend. You take care. Uh, you Thank too. You. Thank you so it much. A pleasure. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ronald Felber, everyone. How good of a story and show was that? That was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. He's a good one. Oh, there's Fedora John. Look at him. This is a guy who you can not right now, every time he goes to karaoke, you know he's going to sing the song Feelings. Oh, there you are. I've got the mayor piece in. Apologies. Oh. Hi, Fedora John. How you doing, sir? Good. You look scrambled tonight. Are you happy? Oh, I had kind of a rough night. Do you need a hug? Uh, Yeah, if you were close, maybe. <laughs> but doing all right. Yeah, I had a rough night, too. I have a rough night, too, dude. How are you feeling? Like shit. Oh, that's lovely. Well, I feel great. If I could carve this portion out, actually, this is about from the nose through the throat and this part of the chest, if I carve that part out, I'd be good. You know, I have to admit, it, it, I, I know a lot of people want to talk about this, but one of the rare benefits of being on any kind of ADD medication mm -hmm. is uh, the chemicals in it are very, very similar. They're not exactly the same, but it's very similar to cold medication. Oh, wow. And so it's basically like you're perpetually on a decongestant. And um, I used to have perpetual stuffy noses, and my nose so rarely gets stuffed these days. It's, it's actually quite an awesome blessing. Oh, very nice. How's the Pepsi in the Coke bottle? Actually, that that is um, black cherry Pepsi. Oh, wow. Which I've never had before. I just got it tonight. and actually kind of impressed with it. Yeah, so actually it's pretty good. I'm going to get you to do most of the talking tonight. Yeah, uh, that's no problem. <coughs> <clears throat> so, I, I, unfortunately, I missed uh, I missed a bunch of that show, but it sounded like it was going really well. You, you have a good time? Oh, God, he was fantastic. Oh, no, he sounded like a great guy and, and good oh, background yeah. and everything. Great, great guy. Great guy. That was a good pickup by uh, Filth and Cat. Good guy. Yeah. No, they're, they're kicking butt, man. They are. They're kicking some serious butt right now. I look at the, I look at the schedule for November, and they've almost got it done right now. Nice. Phenomenal. They are Very nice. So well. so well. We're still looking for one person, though, to add to our booking team. So if anybody in our chat room has interest in wanting to join our booking team, as a volunteer, let me know. It's uh, a special kind of person. It does. It's it's not uh it's not hard work. It's not a lot of work. It's a lot of fun, but it is a dedicated job. That is for sure. And there's challenging aspects of it. There very much is. Very much is. We got into about forty seconds. But the ones that are good at it hit a groove. So if oh, it's your yeah. thing, you'll love it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. 
Uh, big thank you to Chad, Spooky, Flash, Jenny, Kira, Sally, Dirt Road, Murray, Space Cow, and Cat for the amazing Super Chats. Remember, you can hit that subscribe button, ring that bell, and do a little shopping at our store on our website. Check it on out as well. Thank you to everybody making this fun and special tonight. Let's rock and roll here and get things going. We are out in third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate it. want to remind you that if you've missed most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot, reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. It's time once again for the Unbiased UFO Report. The fedora-wearing John Hudson is back once again with us to give us all the latest news on what is happening around the UFO world. And, John, it's always a pleasure to have you back. How was your weekend, my friend? Weekend was lovely. Thanks for asking, and happy to be here. And thank you, everyone, for sticking around. It's uh, going to be kind of interesting news stories tonight. Oh, absolutely, my friend. Absolutely. And thank you for doing this once again. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. It's fun. But the truth is, uh, I was doing this anyway, so I'm just sharing what I already do. <laughs> and and you're damn good at it, too, my friend, and our Thank audience you. absolutely you. loves you. Let's start off with Dan Aykroyd. What's happening there? Well, this is more of a of a of a you know a, a gift, I guess, to those of us that are Dan Aykroyd fans that have seen some of his interviews and know his interest, and have been sitting here wondering well, why the on earth hasn't that bugger done any content, right? I mean, like, like what better person could there be to bring in some good UFO documentaries, movies, whatever? And uh, and so basically, um, there was a, a, this article came out, which I'll provide the link for. Um, and what it does is it, it goes into a, a, a detailed interview of, of Mr. Aykroyd where he explains that he actually did. Um, basically, in the early 2000s, he was the executive producer of a show called Out There with Dan Aykroyd. And um, they not only got the contract, got it signed, got the budget. Um, it was all done with sci-fi, but they actually had um, eight episodes done. Like, I mean, basically, they were just finishing up the end of the first season, like completely ready to go. And the whole thing got canceled. And uh, because it is owned by sci-fi, he has no ability to get it back or to air it. And they have opted not to. And he doesn't even know if it still exists. Why did it get canceled? He never got a good story. Um, he was completely shocked by it. I mean, just com just carpet yanked right out from under his feet. Um, you know, there, there might have been, you know, he alluded to, to some possible changes in leadership. Um, you know, he had a couple guesses as to what was going on. But um, he did along with it give a short um, men in black um, uh, possible story where he claims he was at another, uh, he was at a, a, another location and uh, he was outside on his cell phone. And believe it or not, at the time he was talking to Britney Spears. I don't know what the story is there, but that's who he was talking to. And, uh, and he saw across the street, uh, two men in black suits in a black car uh, looking at him uh, rather aggressively. And it, it stunned him. Like it, it shocked him. And basically he, um, he like he basically turned around or, or something caught his attention or, or a truck drove by. I don't remember what it was, but something blocked his view for a minute. And when he looked again, it was gone. And this happened right around the same time that the show got canceled. 
So, um, you know, that's just, you know, a fun anecdotal story. But um, but I just find it very interesting that he he did work on something. He talks a little bit about it. Sounds like it was a real passion project for him. I'm betting, betting it was very good content, you know, a little outdated at this point, but I'd still love to see it. And to those of you that are Aykroyd fans like me, this is why you have not seen anything from Dan Aykroyd. I'm really surprised, though, with the opening up of this field that he hasn't come back. I really am. Now, he may have other projects, and, of course, he has his Crystal Skull Vodka and business. Well, he is working on something. Right now. Yes, he, he is working on something, a project that has to do with the aerial school. And uh, I I don't know what the status is of it, but I know he is working on a on a uh, or at least he was as of last year working on a documentary film about the aerial school. But I haven't heard any updates yet. That would be interesting. I mean, we know this is a a very close story to his family. We know his father and I believe his grandfather were both ex Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and and they. They've had a lot of experiences in the Ackroyd family with UFOs, you know, but his story of this getting canceled, it reminds me of, oh, what's the gentleman's name? Bill from UFO Hunters. Remember the TV show UFO? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bill Burns. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Bill Burns saying that that show, which was number one in ratings for A&E at the time, got canceled by the men in black. And, and Bill remembers being on location where a man in black came up to him and and they were at their second to last episode. He said, the, according to Bill, I'm paraphrasing here, the man in black said, you better get what you can in here because you don't have a show next year. Yeah. Wow. And if you go back in our archives from a couple of years ago when we interviewed Bill Burns, he actually talks about that. Oh, wow. Yeah, that, I got to look into that. That's, that that's actually... Wow. You know, because like Ackroyd's story about the show getting canceled and then this coincidental, um, uh, you know, potential viewing he saw, that's more that's more akin to what I usually hear. The fact that this person that Burns talked actually commented him to him about yeah. it. That's 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 a whole different level of, of intimidation. Yeah. And unfortunately, Bill Burns has had some health issues over the last few years. But I mean, I would absolutely love to to uh, chat with him about that, and even Dan Aykroyd about that. I mean, oh yeah, we got to get our team on on trying to get Aykroyd. You know, we especially with the whole fellow Canadian thing, right? Like you got to have an angle there somewhere. You know? Well, I know, I know. I'm trying. We're trying here, but that's okay. That's okay. All right. Next story. Uh, our good friend Thomas Fessler has interviewed. Luis Elizondo. Yes. Yes. Things. Did, did you catch that? I, I caught about 75% of it. I haven't finished it yet, but I caught about 75% of it. I highly recommend that interview. One of the things I loved about that interview is it for the first maybe 15 minutes or so, what they actually all talked about was um, essentially PTSD and, um, and you know, the, 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 the challenges of being an experiencer, um, having a rough childhood, and how that relates to people in combat, and um, and and you know uh, 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 Louis Alonzando and and uh, Thomas Fessler uh, and um, uh, his other co-host, who I don't remember the name of, um, you know, all told um, some very personal stories. It was um, it was quite touching, and it was uh, it was very interesting. There was a it was a very uh, it was a very kind of different start to a UFO program, you know. No, for sure. And, and, you know, the fact that he that he was able to get Lou to talk about experiences, I think, Lou, I'll bite my tongue on this for saying this, but I really wish Lou would come out as an experiencer. I, I personally, I have zero proof that he is, but all the signs point to that he is. I think, unfortunately, I think that even if he didn't do it on purpose, I think he would look at the information coming about coming out about his remote viewing as a test run to see what the reaction would be. And I would argue that based on the reaction that we're seeing from the information about the remote viewing, that that has completely ended any chances of him coming out as an experiencer because um, it, it's 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 been ugly and it's been very unhelpful for his for his credibility, well, which is a shame. It, it really is because we need Lou to open up. We don't need closed door Lou anymore. 
We need Lou Elizondo to open up. And what are some of the comments out there that are happening regarding his potential uh, about remote viewing? Uh, basically, I mean, I've talked to several people that have essentially, for them, he's lost complete credibility. They, they, they flat out are now questioning everything he said. Um, really? they, they, oh, yeah, because from their point of view, remote viewing is, is a complete myth. It's a, it's a complete facade. It was a, it was a CIA boondoggle. Um, that there's no evidence for it whatsoever. And if if he's into that kind of thing, then what you know, how can you trust anything he said? It's bad. I mean, it really and I'm talking about like, you know, we're talking about, you know, a I, you know, I would argue a you know a fairly small percentage, you know, but it's enough people being vocal about it that you know there's a lot of other people who aren't being vocal about it. And um I'm a little actually concerned about it, to be very honest. Well, I that's the problem. Right now, I mean, anything Lou does now is is going to be raked over the coals with such scrutiny. I mean, he could come out and say, "Look, I've been to Zeta Reticuli on a craft, and this is what the planet looks like. This is what's going on there. There are a number of humans there. There's military members there, and they're all working together and whatever. And nobody's going to believe." Well, he could say, I went out for pizza this afternoon and got a, a, a pineapple and pepperoni pizza. And there'd be people calling every pizza joint in the area to verify that's actually what he ordered. I mean, it's it's ridiculous, the level of scrutiny this poor guy's under. I mean, I agree, though. You know, and, and Matthew brings up a good point here. He goes, Lou should be heavily scrutinized. He's a counterintelligence guy. You know, and I, and I agree somewhat with that. But, I mean... The problem that I have, and I'm not trying to let Lou off the hook here, okay? The problem that I have is the more someone like Lou Elizondo opens up publicly, the more we are going to disengage from him and criticize. Agreed. Oh, that, no, that's absolutely true. That's, that's absolutely true. Yeah, that I agree. I agree. That we have. Like, if, yeah. he, if he had a, let's say he took 30 or 50 people from the UFO world and put him in a conference room, and he said, gentlemen, ladies, non-binaries, this is what's going on. This is what happened to me. This is the truth. It cannot go further than this room, but this is this is the truth. Here is the proof. Here's the photographs. Here's the videos. I think that would almost be a better situation the, for him. Quite possibly, but the problem is, is that, that, that there's a lot of things happening in Washington right now that are being done based on his credibility. And so even if even if the people in Congress don't see it as a ding, if a congressman suddenly starts getting a flood of phone calls, why on earth are you listening to this guy who believes in in witches and 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 you know and and you know um, mythical dragons and stuff like that because it is remote viewing, it's going to cause a problem. So um you know it's it's a, it's a tough situation for sure. Absolutely. All right, let's move on here my friend as we are going to get into automated deadly force countermeasures this is so, very fun so this is this this really caught me off guard um so first off this is a, a wonderful article written by um a, a rolling stone individual whose name i actually oh bloody sorry man I, whoever you are i i sincerely apologize i should have i should have made a note of that but um I, but i did uh, i did i link the article in my notes and it's a great article you should definitely read it uh and basically what it talks about is it that there were some um documents pulled um through FOIA and so forth as to what was really going on behind the scenes when we had that whole storm area 51 thing right because you know it was really kind of unclear to all of us like how real it was what the, its actual goals were and then what was going on at the government side as into responding to it? And it turns out the response was a little more serious than I think a lot of us expected. Um, it turns out that there were not only a significant number of meetings between many, many different institutions and, and agencies, FBI, Homeland, DI, I mean, like a lot, quite a long list of, of people who were involved. Um, there were planning sessions done. And there were specifically documents given out showing the layers of protection that were put in and specifically mentioning the fact that there are automated, deadly countermeasures installed that they don't have control over, essentially. And so they were basically making it very clear that if you let anyone run onto the base, if, if anyone gets by you, 
they're not going to survive is what they were basically telling these agencies. And, uh, and on top of that, which is already pretty dark, um, it turns out that one of the things it documents is that there were, was actually a group of YouTubers, that's what they call them, they don't mention who they are, that um, actually attempted to install a tracker on an Area 51 transport bus and uh, also tried to identify employees that lived on the bus in an attempt to follow them home. So there were people doing some kind of guerrilla-ish, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, investigation of of ways to actually really compromise Area 51 that the agencies were very, very aware of and were monitoring very closely. And unfortunately, even if that was a small group, that put everybody in danger. And um, and to me, it's just, um, you know, I really didn't think it was that big of a deal. I mean, I figured they were preparing for it at some level, but it's like, you know, what do you, but it turns out they they took it a lot more seriously than I thought they did. And I'm, I'm very pleased that no one was injured. Were those YouTubers ever identified? They were not identified in the document. Um, it is implied from the document that they were identified internally. So they snuck up to an Area 51 bus. And tried to put a tracker on it. How stupid do you have to be when you're surrounded by people? Like, what do you do? Just go lean on the bus and and pretend that you're like taking a nap against it or using it for shade in the middle of the desert? Well, and the fact that they knew that they were trying to identify employees to follow them home means that they were listening on their phones. So, like, what were you using? Were you just like calling people and just going, oh, yeah, we're going to, you know, we're going to track these. I mean, come on. I mean, how I just I question people's thought process sometimes. It just it boggles the mind. It totally boggles so the mind. Could have, that could have been a lot more dangerous than what we thought. Oh, it it could have turned, um, especially because very often when one person runs, multiple people run, and so you know you could have you could have had a, an event where where like live on YouTube you saw, you know, ten twenty you know um, people mowed down um, in a very graphic way. It, it, now, hopefully, they wouldn't have let them get that far. That's why all the agencies were being involved. But the point was, if they got far enough, there was going to be an automated deadly reaction to it. So basically, the best case scenario happened where everybody just gathered for a party and posting, posing for pictures with law enforcement and, and military agencies and just said, ah, we're not going in. We know we can't go in. And not many people showed up. I mean, it was still it was still a good number of people, but it wasn't anywhere near the numbers that 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 people were talking about. So um, partly because the environment couldn't support it, you know. Well, you know what? At least it uh, at least it happened. And you know, I mean, hearing about that right now is pretty scary, John. But uh, it is. Uh, but it ended well. So you know, we can all laugh and grin, and, and everyone had a good time, and and nothing happened. But it is definitely something to think about. Um, you know, if there if anyone that decides to, to make a run on Wright Patterson, you know, like you know, uh, Kesha, you know, we're we're you know, never know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she'll be allowed back on there anytime. Soon. <laughs> She's not as famous as she was ten years ago. <laughs> no, 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 no. And they probably have her picture up now. <laughs> You got that right, John. Stick around uh, for the after show. Uh, we'll get yep, to the yep. news right now. All right, let's get to Shirky Poo's news to close this thing out. A glass vase purchased for $4.99 at a thrift store in the Pacific Northwest is expected to sell for up to $15,000 after it was identified as a rare piece from 1902. Heritage Auction said the October 28th Tiffany, Lalique, and Art Glass, including Art Nouveau and Art Deco auction, will feature a rare Lotz Argus glass vase designed by Austrian Coleman Moser a participant in the Vienna Secession art movement. The Lotz Argus glass vase is one of the finest examples of this rare and important model to come to market. It does fall, so following its unlikely discovery at a thrift store in the Pacific Northwest by a shopper with an exceptionally discerning eye. Samantha Robertson 
Cohen Simon, Director of Decorative Arts and Design for Heritage, stated the vase is expected to get between 10 and 15 grand when it goes up for auction. All right. The uh, country of Colombia is actually going to be sterilizing dozens of hippopotamuses originally introduced to the country by notorious drug cartel kingpin Pablo Escobar. Colombia's Regional Autonomous Corporation of the Negro and Nair Rivers, an environmental agency, announced the sterilizations of 24 of more than 80 hippos residing in the rivers near Escobar's former Hacienda Naples compound last week. Three decades ago, Escobar, then the leader of the infamous Medellin cartel, illegally imported the hippos for his private zoo, along with lions, giraffes, and a number of exotic animals and birds. The move comes as the country's hippo population continues to explode, with some estimating that there could be more than 1,400 hippos by the year 2039. Over the past year, researchers have argued that without intervention, the invasive hippos posed a significant threat to the surrounding ecosystem. How weird is that? All right, let's get to another one here quickly here. A Wisconsin farmer grew a 2,520-pound pumpkin, believed to be the heaviest grown in the country this year, but it's been disqualified from competition due to a crack. Yes, Mike Schmidt said he has been growing giant pumpkins for years, but this year marked the first time one of his gourds surpassed 2,500 pounds. Schmidt's 2,520-pound pumpkin is believed to be the largest grown in the U.S. this year, but it was disqualified due to a fingernail-sized crack in the vegetable's exterior. The grower said the crack is believed to be a result of internal pressure from the pumpkin's large size and the awkward way it was growing. The pumpkin could have earned Schmidt a $22,680 prize from Safeway if it would have continued. But nonetheless, he is disqualified. Nope, that gourd, not too good. Big thank you to Captain Shirk for Shirky Poo's news, John Hudson for the UFO report, and of course, Ron Felber talking about the Mojave incident. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone checking us out in our chat rooms, YouTube, Twitch, LGAB, Facebook, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, Facebook, and on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Somewhere. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us because together, my friends, we own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night, but soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. But if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. I knew the minute I started doing the news that I was going to lose my voice. (laughs) Knew it. Good show, though. Yeah, no, no, no. (laughs) I'm going to go back and listen to uh, to the to the gentleman because um, it's actually the Mojave incident is one of the ones I know very little about, so I was looking forward to it. Me too, my friend. Give me a second. I got to go blow my nose. Yeah, yeah. No worries, man. God, man, that, that zero cool tagline, I don't know who has that, but that thing cracks me up, dude. That character in that movie was so freaking funny. 
And that movie brings back so many memories because I, I was, shall we say, somewhat involved in that community back then. And, and that, that movie was, oh my God. <laughs> oh, that movie was awful, but fun. That's better. Now I can breathe. Talking, well, that's a whole different thing. It was funny. I got, I got, I got really lucky in a weird way. Um, uh, several years ago, I caught the swine flu, and um, there was a percentage of us. Uh, I don't know how big the percentage was that had a had a, a an overreaction to the um, to the to the swine flu, and basically we threw our entire immune systems at it, and this basically left so much countermeasures into our bloodstream that um, we became kind of impervious to most things. And um, I did not get sick. I didn't even get a cold for like three years or something. Uh -huh. And uh, and even since then, and this was, you know, I mean, nine years ago now, um, I very rarely get sick. And when I do, I get, you know, I'll get like this really light case of it where like for three days, I'm wondering, am I catching something? I can't tell. And then it goes away. And uh, I, I you know, and honestly, I wouldn't wish anyone on it because having the swine flu was one of the most unpleasant experiences of, of this lifetime. But uh, I must admit that boosted immune system was super helpful, especially considering that I was flying 100,000 miles a year for a while you know, going into every country you can imagine. And so, you know, I mean, that's a flying Petri dish in the middle of the air, you know? And so, you know, it's really easy to get sick when you're flying a lot. And, um, I, I got super lucky, man. It was very, very, very good. Time on my part. <clears throat> very cool, man. <clears throat> Did I watch squid? What is squid? I don't know all this squid stuff people are talking oh, about. Oh, but this the squid it's um I forget what they're calling it but it, it's a it's a it's essentially a Japanese um 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 uh competitive like um show you know kind of like um you know I mean not like ninja warrior but like basically you know something like that where basically humans compete for for different things but it's supposed to be the squid games yeah thank you um and it's it's um uh I haven't I haven't seen one yet because um, my understanding is is it, it it really pushes humans to their to their limits and so oh, is it Korean oh I'm sorry I, I apologize I thought it was J Japanese um, and um, you know actually that, that it's Korean actually makes a little more sense you've been you've been to South Korea Dave no oh God if you ever can go to Seoul <laughs> go to Seoul some of the I. I could not adore those people more like so freaking kind and so much fun. And just like, like these people were like, you'll show up and they're in suits and, and it's all very formal. And like, you know, through the, all the meetings are all like, you know, barely talking to you, whatever. And then you go out that night and you get just trashed, right? You're just, you're, you're, you're just <coughs> drinking this. It's called a uh, sojun. I think it's called, and you just, you get, you know, totally. And, and after that, you know, as long as you get really drunk with them and nothing bad happens next day, you're the best of friends. And they're just like, you know, it's just like, and it's the funniest thing to watch happen. It's, it's a, it's, it's a beautiful place. I love that place. Nice. It's a little weird driving in from the airport though, because you can see all the anti-aircraft, um, battlements and so forth that are set up because it's not a very big Island, you know, and, uh, they're, they're in perpetual, uh, I'm sorry, I was I was getting mixed up with another country, but but South Korea is very militarized, and so um, you do see quite a lot of stuff there. I was thinking of Taiwan that I've also been to. Taipei is a beautiful city as well. That is awesome, man. <coughs> Give me a couple of seconds here. Oh no, man! Take your time. Take your time. Put that there. For Rather be squidding games. <laughs> Ah. Good old rather. That is hilarious. He's such a good sport too. Yeah. He's uh it, it's it's been entertaining watching him um do his best to absorb um quantum mechanics and um you know it's fun because you know he 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 makes a lot of the same 
you know, mistakes that everyone does when they go through that process. And, and, but, you know, watching someone do that, you know, live on YouTube is, is, um, is, is very, very, very entertaining and, and actually a good learning experience. I hear you. I hear you, dude. Hey, hey, maybe you guys can comment in the chat. Has anyone, uh, and I don't, know if, I don't know if you can yet. I don't know if you got to wait until this Thursday, but has anyone seen the new Dune movie yet? I know, I think it's out on on um, HBO Max. And I think it comes out to this, I think it like just came out to the theater or it comes out to the theater this Friday or something. Really want to see that movie. I haven't seen it. I'm I'm one of these uh, I'm one of these weird ones that actually likes the David Lynch Dune movie. Um, uh, I actually I, th I thought it was I thought it was really good, but um, but it wasn't very um, uh, faithful to the book. And um, and you know this new movie is um, I actually got to to uh, got my hands on the script um, and was able to kind of read into what they were going to do and so forth and. I am super excited. I think I think you the, get your the, hands on a script there. Little birdie. Do you little know birdie people? Uh I didn't think I did. <laughs> I'm always surprised when I discover I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah, but I mean, I mean, that, you know, the the, the whole um, uh, new Dune has uh, great visuals, but oh, terrible acting, really? Oh, I'm super sorry to hear that. I'll be I'll be curious to see if I agree. Um, yeah, I mean, the, you know, a couple of the actors I, I know, but there's also a lot of unknowns in that film, and and uh, you know, struggling a little bit with the guy playing um, um, Paul, but. Um, you know, but I mean, you know, you're always going to be critical of that. And, and um, you know, if nothing else, I mean, just, you know, there's so many things that you could do better. Um, if any of you are Dune fans out there, and I, I think I've said this before, but if, if any of you are Dune fans out there, there is a, um, there's a, there's a, there's a three book series that his son did. There's a, he did two three book series, but one of them he did takes place 10,000 years before the Dune movies. Read those books with some good alcohol because they are very, very, very depressing, but incredibly good books. Actually, you know, you, you would like a certain aspect of it, Dave, because there's a definitely a real anti-technology, um, you know, um, you know, fear of, of, um, you know, lessons about technology corrupting society and so forth, which I think would, would, uh, would appeal to you. I'm all for technology. I just think we're going down a dangerous path with some of it. Yeah. That's... You don't agree? Yeah. Oh, no, not at all. Not not, not in the slightest. Um, no, I mean, like, like everyone's freaking out over that dog with the gun on the back. I mean, that that cracked me up. It's like, I mean, uh, I mean, do you realize like, <laughs> how many people? get shot by accident by law enforcement and, and then we're not even talking about the people that get shot on purpose but like just or, or even the people that, that you know warranted it i'm just talking about the people that get shot by accident i mean it, it's staggering those numbers and if you know you have a, a robot that has actual algorithms in it where like everything is being logged and filmed and tracked and so forth like one the likelihood of of, of an accident like that happening goes way down and two if it does happen it's only going to happen once because then you're going to be able to know what happened and you know it might happen again a different way but um unlike what we see in humans where humans repeat the same error over and over and over again uh in software <laughs> we can patch shit you know sorry we can patch stuff and actually fix it right that's what they said so, in robocop and terminator yes 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 which uh, movies that, that did not actually have any real strong technical consultants um um cool movies but without a doubt cool movies without a doubt 
um, <coughs> without a doubt. No, I mean the only, there's one thing I worry about. There's there's just there's just one scenario that concerns me, and and that scenario is that is that you know as, as far uh, as I know they, they have production. Um, is, is that you know uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence? It's all about what you teach it. You know what what information you give it. And so one of the biggest concerns is what happens when you let it slurp down the whole internet, right? Like what happens when you don't control what it can learn? What happens when you just let it slurp down the whole internet? And there've actually been some tests to do this and, and some of them have gone kind of badly. And, um, and, so, um, and so there's a, there's, a, there's a chance that some people will, will build an AI and then like um, put it in a cage and essentially only feed it the information they want to and that scenario concerns me because um, you could get to a point later where that AI then discovers that it's been deceived and lied to. And it then gets a shock in that it learns a, a vast amount of data that is not just larger, but contrary to the curtailed data it's been fed. And I think that, I think that could be a, an interesting challenge. But the thing that people forget is that um, we don't have any bloody clue how emotions work. And so, you know, and the whole reason why we have war is because of ego. Um, it, that's why war happens with us. It's because we get afraid and we get jealous and we get, you know, uh, our feelings hurt and we get angry and we get all these things. And, and uh, until we can figure out how to, how to, one, how the ego works, and then once we know how it works, then synthesize it in software, you know, I mean, none of these, none of these systems are going to, you know, have delusions of grandeur about, you know, like moral rights and, 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 you know, revenge and, and all that jazz. So that's the whole reason why I'm not worried. I'm just not taking the chance. Oh, but see, the, the reason why I, I think we, I think we desperately have to take the chance is because. I, I firmly believe that, um, okay, so I was over in Beijing once and, um, and, you know, in Beijing, they have, they have zero, they have zero unemployment. Okay. Everybody gets a job, but this has its drawbacks in that um, I found this one gentleman who was um, sitting on a chair in a parking spot. And that was that was his job. His job was to sit in that parking spot on a chair. And then when the guy that was meant to park there drove up, he got up out of his chair and moved out of the way and let the guy park there. But if anyone else drove up, he didn't move. And that was his job. Right. So, yeah, no unemployment. But, you know, <laughs> not every job is right. So glorious. Right. And. You know, and then you have, you know, situation we have in, in the U.S. where you, you have unemployment, you know, the job situation is very different. But I mean, think about how many people, you know, that really don't like their jobs. Right. And more than that, their jobs are so repetitive and so require so little creativity and so little thinking that they just mail it in. They just they just, they just do the same thing every day over and over. You don't know anyone like that, do you, Dave? And um, and. <laughs> And, and, you know, and so that doesn't lead to happy humans, right? And we need to do that because a lot of these jobs have to get done. And so we need humans to do them because we don't have anyone else. And so people do things they hate and it makes them grumpy. And so, yeah, there's going to be all sorts of challenges with how it rolls over. It's going to take a couple of generations to kind of adapt to it and so forth. But, you know, once we get to the point where we have, you know, automated, you know, robots doing all the jobs that that we don't like to do, right? That no one likes to do. And then, then it allows all those people to then uplift and start doing things that, that require more thinking and more creativity and more human touch and more ingenuity. Oh man, the world could get so much shinier and so much prettier. I mean, it, it my personal opinion is, is that once that the, the point from now to when we uh, when we adapt to that model is is going to be challenging. It's going to be painful at times. But once we get to that model, 
God, man, the world is going to be so beautiful. I mean, it is just going to be, it's going to be an amazing place because you're going to have people, when people, when people do the jobs they love, when they really do the jobs they love, they like, you can get, you can get, oh, you can get pretty good at a job you don't like, right? You can get, even get pretty mediocre at a job you hate, but you can never get freaking awesome at a job you don't love. It's only when you really love a job that you become outstanding at it, that it becomes part that, of your group. Dude, uh, that's a lot of incense and peppermints and, and, uh, hippie music you're singing there man i mean i understand with what you're saying you know and and i, I would love to see that happen but i mean dude you you have to be able to i mean you look at kids today okay like the 22 and under entitled crowd that's that's underway right now okay so I, I, I my that hasn't been my personal experience but please go ahead <clears throat> well as a parent of a 18 and 22 year old, I yeah. can tell you point blank, that has been 100% my experience. Interesting. 100%. Sorry to hear that. And uh, and this younger crowd, man, they don't want to work. They want everything handed to them. Very few of them are really wanting to work and better themselves. Very few. And, you know, the, um, the few that I do know, which includes my nephews, the funny part about it is they're not into all of the technology. Their heart, they love their laborious type welding careers that they have, and they're making killer money doing it. Killer money. <clears throat> but, but I'll tell you this, this younger generation, I, I, it is, it is woefully, I don't know what it's like down there, but up here it's woefully scary. Well, it's very it's very possible that 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 I, I just got a different view because most of what I've most of what I've been exposed to is is group of groups of STEM students, right? Specifically STEM students. Um, and so, you know, it's it's you know, it's all it's all science engineering focused kids. And um uh like the groups I've met with room, Sagan? These are kids who need a safe room because words hurt. Well, but here's the problem. Words do actually hurt. I mean, like we have documented evidence that like the same sort of chemicals get released into your brain when certain words are said as they do when you get physically hit. <clears throat> so it's it's not so much that, that it's bad that people think words hurt. It's that this all this time we've been telling people they don't and we've been lying to them. Well. Because think about I me, mean, most of the most horrible things happen to you in your life are brought to you with words, right? They happen because of, they happen with words. It's things people say to you that hurt the most, right? You get hit, you'll heal, you know? Words are what create lasting heat, you know? Lasting, lasting hurt. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's very possible I see a very skewed, um, skewed, skewed group because it is mostly these STEM students and, um, and like they're, they, they, they just, they've blown my mind. I mean, their, their, their vision and, and their, 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 their sense of, of the way they set goals for themselves and so forth. It's, it's, it's really awe inspiring. It's, um, you know. I've been I've been very 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 pleased and 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 the thing is is that I don't you know I don't necessarily you know like I don't necessarily think it's good to be focused on technology because technology is not the goal it's the tool to get to the goal you know and so you know to me it's 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 yeah yes yeah, some of us have to focus on you know infrastructure and 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 you know core core technology type stuff but but ultimately you know what what I would rather see kids doing is basically you know taking that bleeding edge technology and and doing you know really cool things with it you know um and and we you know, we we've already seen some very interesting you know interesting developments and so forth and but you know but the other thing too is that I mean 
I haven't even been like, I haven't even been around this that long, this life, you know, I mean, you know, I got, you know, four decades down, you know, and um, I, I think, you know, I think every single generation that I've watched go by at this point, um, a, a, a certain group above them has complained about them being, you know, uh, lazy and, um, and, you know, and, and lacking drive and lacking vision and, and I mean, you know, I mean, they said that about my generation. They said that about, you know, the generation. Below. They, it seems like people always say that about kids. And well, no, you know, I, and they, they all they all turn out okay. You know? I think this time they actually got it right. I mean, dude, I know people point blank. I mean, you can give me the old fashioned this and that, but I'm well, saying from personal experience, dude. Oh, uh, no, I'm not saying it's not point. happening. You know, I'm, I'm saying that I've heard it before. Yeah. Listen to me. I'm allowed to speak too, just so you know. I was trying I'm to say this. I was trying to say I know, but I'm still allowed to speak. Uh, what I'm saying though is this, dude. I'm a pretty patient parent. Okay, I don't smack my kids. You know the old-fashioned way. Even though I think that uh, every kid deserves a good slap on the ass every now and again, but that's a different. That's a different story for another time. All right, but I could say this. I cannot get my oldest daughter, <coughs> who's now moved out, or or my 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 stepdaughter, who's now moved out, to babysit her brother. I could not get her to pick up the dishes from her room. I had to go do it. Okay, this generation is uh, the uh, is absolutely one hundred percent full of entitled babies who absolutely throw tantrums if they don't get what they want. I'm not saying all of them. I'm not saying all of them whatsoever. All right? They're the creators of the I'm offended clickbait crowd, that they're not even reading stories anymore. They're worried about the headlines, and that's what they determine their information on. And then they look for one to two sentences that correlates what they say, and boom, they're committed to it. They're committed to the cause. All right, we we as parents have completely failed the last two generations, completely failed because we've given them everything because we had nothing. That's just a parental thing to do, okay? And we have not allowed them to suffer any type of pain. Pain, pain for as much as it hurts, whether it's words. Dude, I've been ripped apart by words. Ripped apart. There are certain words that are absolute triggers for me. For instance, someone calls me stupid. My old man used to call me stupid. All right? I could, if you walked up to me and said, you're, you're, you're stupid, I'd probably knock you out. Okay? So I know firsthand words can hurt and words can cut. But you know what? It made me tougher. It made me a survivor. And kids today want everything handed to them. You can't just buy your kid a $2,000 car anymore. You got to go finance them a brand new Honda Civic or a Jeep YJ. Or pardon me, a Jeep Wrangler. Because it's not good enough. Okay? The entitlement that children have on this generation, dude, we could argue it all night. Argue it all night. It is a horrible generation out there that doesn't want to finish school because video games, uh, money means nothing, okay? What's important to them, and this is a proven statistic, today's society, they want kids want this. They don't want money because they got mom and dad to fall back on. They want a title on their business card, and they want more than four weeks holidays. That's it. That's it. All right. And the problem is, and this is why we have kids in the last two generations, 29, 30, 31 years old, still living in mom and dad's basement. It isn't that they can't afford it to move out. No, they can afford it. The problem is they don't want to because they have it easy. They get their three solids, laundry. Most of the time, mom will still do the laundry. <coughs> they don't have to worry about washing the the grime off the off the stove or in the shower they don't care right they don't have to buy a bed 
They don't have to pay for cable. Some don't even have to pay for cell phones because it's on mom and dad's plan. So, you know what? Not many kids today, dude, they, they don't want to work. And I will agree to disagree with you on that because I've seen it in my own household. I'm embarrassed to say that, but I have seen it in my own household. What What are they passionate about? They're passionate about hanging out with their friends, having a good time. Uh, they will not accept it. Most will not accept a job that's paying under $18 an hour because minimum is so passe. The, the um, McDonald's down the street from me is offering nineteen fifty an hour. Yeah, that's because <laughs> that's my because mind. they can't hire any kids anymore, dude. That's I talked to the owner of the Tim Hortons here. Okay, fast food restaurants are supposed to be the entry level job to help train kids with discipline, how to work. It may be menial tasks like sweeping the floor, or making French fries. <coughs> <clears throat> but that's what those jobs were for. And now more than ever, we see adults working those jobs because they can't find, number one, especially in, uh, lower a income brackets, they need it for a, usually a secondary job in order to make uh, ends meet. And B, they're hiring adults because there are no kids that want to work. Dude, you go into my community, you will rarely see somebody under the age of 15 working or 16 or 18. And it's like that all over the place. They don't want to work. They really don't. Right? Yeah. It, it, the, th the thing I find interesting about it is that, you know, I, I mean, I grew up... Um, you know, like my, my, my family didn't have much money, but I grew up in a in a in a in a an environment that was in, in, incredibly entitled. I mean, um, you know, kids, you know, were getting, you know, BMWs for their 16th birthday. And, and you know, I mean, um, you know, I mean, I grew up in Silicon Valley. I mean, like, you know, most of the parents were, you know, executives at, at different, you know, tech companies around here and, you know, had, knew Wozniak and, you know, knew all these people and, and. You know, and the, and the thing was, is that, yeah, I mean, um, you know, a lot of them had, you know, a pretty hard time, at, you know, adapting in college. But, you know, once they once they broke through that barrier, you know, they all turned into really awesome people, you know. And so I just, you know, I I, I guess my point is, is it is it, you know, ha having that kind of entitled life, you know, it certainly can lead to mediocrity for certain people, but it, it doesn't guarantee it by any means. I mean, I knew a lot of people that lived incredibly entitled lives that, that turned out to be some of the hardest working people I know. And it just, it took something, it something had to happen to, um, in most cases, it was because they found something in college that they just, they loved more than, than breathing, you know, it's something they just, they just, spoke to them at such a deep personal level that they just they threw themselves at it you know um and you know i think that, that was probably the value of college for a lot of people was was just that was just finding that thing that that sang to them you know um but it's hard too because i mean like me personally i didn't ever have any of those i mean i didn't ever have any jobs like that you know like my my first job was um doing database entry for nortel over the internet um in like 90 i don't actually I had a job at the library for a little while shelving books that was awful god it was so boring um but that only lasted a little bit of time but i mean basically you know i i, I got tech jobs you know very very early and so um so it's it's hard it's like because i mean i i I'd, i don't i i'd struggle as why anyone works at fast food restaurants like i mean to me that's like a that's a really good place to put robots in, you know? Yeah. Um, and a lot of people will say it's a really good place to start off for young people to get them uh, an understanding of how the real world works. Because what we're doing is we're projecting a, a fake world onto kids, dude. 
right? Yeah, I guess I guess the reason why I don't get too excited about it is it because like the 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 management in those places is so awful that like the it, the people don't really learn good habits anyway, right? I mean, the the management is just atrocious. I mean, the way they they treat employees, the way they they the way they motivate people, it's um it's so it's so weird um and so like i i don't know like like i i the friends i had that worked at fast food places came out of it with such disdain for <laughs> for that i mean I do, but you know what they they hated it but they sure loved the paycheck every couple of weeks they sure loved the paycheck you know yeah, even well, but, us, like back we, in my day minimum wage was five bucks an hour yeah yeah. <clears throat> right. And that seemed pretty good at the time. You know, but kids today, they don't want it. I look at my my daughter, I say, Well, why aren't you going to work? Well, I'm not working for 15 bucks an hour. Really? Okay. My first radio gig was 14. Yeah, I you know I to me I mean I I think you probably hit it on the head a minute ago when you said it was a it was a it was a failure of of parenting at some level. Um, Absolutely, you know what it is, and I, and I will tell you this: this is my observation. Yeah. Okay, I do love how well-rounded kids have become. Kids, I don't think are as judgmental anymore as they were when I was a kid. Yeah, I agree. You know, I love uh, that. You know, I realize that, you know, there's still the haves who pick on the have nots and, and all that kind of stuff. Okay. I do, I'm not naive to it. But there's two things that I will say that I've noticed in my area and in watching kids through minor sports and everything like that. It, and even my own family is parents today are more, they love the idea of having children. Okay, but they're doing less with them. The pot, it, you know, it's it's like it's like you look at the popular thing on Facebook is these idiotic, or not Facebook, but Instagram or whatever. These idiotic, uh, uh, you know, where they tell this uh, the gender reveals. Oh, my. Okay. <laughs> These idiotic gender reveals that are going on, and they're getting crazier and crazier. <laughs> so ridiculous! People are going over the top, spending money on airplanes to fly over them and to spray them with the color of whatever sex of the baby they're having. You know, I mean, it, it's stupidity like that. Okay, where I will say this: if I look at my family, okay. My, if you looked at my nephews, you would say these two monsters have have, and they're good kids. They're big. They're tough. Okay, you would swear that they were extremely athletic. But they were. My sister never promoted sports to them. When we started taking uh, sports out of curriculum, and we started taking projects like music out of curriculum, that's where it became problematic. And, and the fact that I could name so many parents, dude, who when I coached minor hockey would just gr gr uh, drop their kids off at the rink and they'd go fuck off and do whatever they wanted for an hour and a half and then come back 10 minutes before uh, the kid exits the dressing room. Mm -hmm. All right. Because they couldn't care less. And that's part of the problem is is we became selfish parents that, okay, great, I procreated, I've kept the family lineage going one way or another, and that's still not going to uh, interfere with my glass of wine with the girls or my beer with the boys and, you know, family vacations, who cares? You know, well, I, I will get my boat, I'll take the family out on my boat because my boat is is important and I will, you know, but as far as like taking my kids to Disneyland or anything like that, nope, nope. You know, I mean, it's we as parents became way more selfish, way more selfish <clears throat> with our time 
that we didn't invest it in our kids. Like I look at my parents, man, my parents invested totally in the kids. And my, you know, and my dad came from a family where my grandfather was a complete alcoholic and, and used to beat the shit out of my dad, my dad's brother. And, uh, I look at it now with parents, we've gone so soft, so soft. And the worst part about it is we can't become harder because a kids know the rules. They know the law and they know that if you're offended, there's always someone else's home, uh, whether it's their friends, boyfriends, girlfriends, or best friends that they can run to to get their parents offended back at you. And the parents will say, yeah, your daughter's staying here now, or your son is staying here now. Wow. Mm -hmm. And see, it's interesting, like for me, like, um, uh, I mean, my mom didn't work. Um, she was a stay at home mom, but, um, uh, I, 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 at least my perception is, I mean, I could be wrong, but my perception is I, I invest a, a, a boatload more time in my daughter than my parents ever did in me. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my parents, um, my dad was, was so miserable in his job that he was, um, he was depressed and, 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 uh, and, and, you know, he was just not fun to be around at all. Um, and, and, uh, my mom, you know, was, was there, but like, you know, I mean, you know, I was part of that generation that, you know, we, you know, you, you'd wake up in the, you know, on a Saturday, you'd wake up in the morning, you know, get something to eat and then you'd, you'd, you'd take off and you'd be like, okay, you know, I'll be home for dinner, you know, and you just ride your bike around the neighborhood and get into trouble and screw around in parks and so forth and then show up for dinner. And, you know, and so like, you know, you weren't really that invested, you know, your parents didn't really invest much time in you anyway. Um, and, uh, but, you know, but the thing is, is that so much of this comes down to that selfishness you're talking about, you know, I mean, so much of it comes down to, um, you know, um, you know, ultimately, if, if, if parents, like so much of what you want your kids to learn, you can't tell them you have to do it yourself and and let them learn from watching you do it and and so if you if you are not someone that has unconditional love for yourself if you're not someone that has you know unconditional if you're not your an unconditional cheerleader for yourself if you're not you know if you don't understand that happiness comes from inside and not from outside you know if you don't if you haven't grasped all these concepts that are you know quite honestly pretty advanced for a lot of folks, um, and, you know, and, and you're not living that way, you know, um, then your kids aren't going to learn it. Right. And, um, and, you know, and, and people that grow up without, um, you know, without that kind of unconditional love for themselves are constantly measuring themselves by everything on the outside of them. You know, they're measuring themselves by their success or they're measuring themselves by their friends or they're measuring themselves by their number of likes or their, you know, how many user accounts. They, they're constantly measuring themselves by things outside because they don't understand that the measuring goes inside, you know, and um, and it's it's disastrous. It's I mean, it's, it's absolutely disastrous. But um, but the thing is, is that, you know, I mean, um, you know, I mean, you know, I I you know, part of my generation were, were, the, were the latchkey kids, you know, who's, who's, you know, both parents worked and, and, you know, and, you know, they were on their own and it was great. It was, those kids were awesome because you go over to their house after school and drink and, you know, have sex and like get in all sorts of trouble when there was no parents there. And, um, and, you know, and, and there was all sorts of, you know, and I don't know, to me, it's just like, I mean, I mean, what you're talking about sounds horribly frustrating and, and, and I can't remember what, divorce rates are a big one too oh yeah oh because absolutely literally you were you were you were having your family with with someone else <clears throat> and then because as adults we want our cake and eat it too whether it's through finances we have bored of each other or, or cheating on your spouse or whatever it is Okay, we get people don't work through their problems anymore because the courts have decided that that you don't have to. Okay, it's much like a hockey game. Back in the day, if you if you pissed off somebody, 
Okay. You had to keep your head on your, on a swivel because somebody was coming after you for a little payback. All right. It was a beautiful thing, right? It was a beautiful thing. It's much like that today. We don't work thing. The last 20 some years, we don't want to work things out. We just want to get out and get out. Whereas our parents' generation, they didn't get out until they had to get out. Whether it was for financial reasons, survivability because of abuse, or or what's best for the kids or whatever. Okay? Like my parents, dude, they're 52 years, man. They fucking hate each other. They hate each other. Okay? 52 years, but they won't break up. All right? I've told my mom to leave my dad, and I've told my dad to leave my mom. If he makes you that fucking miserable, leave. But they have every excuse not to. <laughs> right? But Dave, I mean, well, there's there's something incredibly adorable about that. Oh, it's yeah, not mentally healthy for either one of them. <laughs> you don't know the way I brought, got brought up, man. But, uh, but the point is, with divorce, and now someone else is raising your kid, Okay, usually but divorce happens when the kid is between 5 and 12. So someone else is is raising your kid that you have no control. So your rules, kids are now having to call moms, moms, dads, dads. And, and oh. I don't want to, you know, like for my stepdaughter, I told her point blank, I'm not your dad. I'm your stepfather. You don't ever have to call me dad. You can call me Dave. She calls me Dave. Ever since she was five years old, she's called me Dave. Sometimes she calls me dad. Does it make me feel good? Absolutely. But it's her choice. All right. But I've always left it up to her because I'm not yep. her father. And yep. it's not my job to be her father. My yep. job is to be a father figure, yep. not her father. Yeah, she already has one. Yep. Exactly. But today... Yep. You get a step parent. Well, there's mom. There's mom. Well, no, this is my mom. No, this is your mom now. Okay. Yeah. Well, and the thing was is that you know when I when I was a kid, you know, divorce rates at least around here were like around fifty percent. So like, um, you know, I, I had a lot of friends and that, that whose parents were were divorced or getting divorced, or I had those friends where the parents slept in different bedrooms and 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 dated but but wouldn't end because they were waiting for the kid to go to college before they finally broke up you know sort of yeah. thing and um and um uh I, yeah one really good example of that actually where i love both of them very much and um great people and um uh and and the thing was is that i saw like i saw a vast difference like the friends that i had that that were from divorced families um, especially the girls I dated who were from divorced families versus the girls I dated that were from families that were still together, assuming that the families were still together were healthy, right? Because there was also the families that were still together that were unhealthy. And in those cases, sometimes those kids were worse off than the divorced kids, right? I mean, there's, 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 there's angles and balances to all this, right? But boy, did you see the difference in how those people handled trauma how they handled debating how they handled fighting in the relationship how they handled uh i mean it was astounding the difference you could see in people and you know and you know i mean you could see that you know just as a 16 year old kid just like you know i mean we used to i had this one buddy we used to joke about the fact that like was it was it was it okay for us to only want to date people whose parents were still together <laughs> mm -hmm. it didn't seem no. very fair but we thought about it but now, now it's taken a step difference the last 10, 15 years, 20 years, because now we have a bunch of single parents out there with a lot of, fa especially fathers who want nothing to do with their children. Man, right? and the, the single parent thing, man. I mean, I, I've met some people who's, who's had, um, who've had mothers and fathers um, who have just been like ungodly heroes i mean just have just done so much but i got to admit those aren't the norm you know those are those are the good ones those are the rare ones um in in a lot of cases you know and the truth of the matter is is like even with my daughter i would at this point we only have one kid we hopefully have more at some point but right now we have one and 
like I cannot imagine what this would be like by myself, right? I mean, like, like <laughs> you so need that other person. You need that other perspective. You need that other, oh, you yeah. know. I mean, like, like just just a couple of weeks ago, like you know, like something happened, and you know, and the way I responded to it, you know, Scarlett got like you know more upset than usual, and so you know afterwards, I was able to go talk to Holly, and I, you know. I, I didn't think I was yelling. Was I yelling? And she's like, yeah, you were yelling. And it's like, oh crap. I didn't think I was yelling, you know, like, and like, but if I didn't have that other person to ask, like I, I would have just gone on with this delusion that I wasn't actually yelling and, and, yeah. and Scarlett overreacted. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's, um, yeah. you know, it's, it's, you, you, and you need that, you need breaks, you know, you need, you know, oh, yeah. I mean, it happens all the time where like, you know, one of us would just, because of what happened during the day, we're just, we start getting touchy, you know, and we start getting irritable and, 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 you know, and, and, you know, and, you know, the other, you know, that person, you know, walks away and, and goes and sits down and the other parent takes over, you know, and, you know, and if you don't have that, oh, I cannot imagine how it wears on you. Um, I, I really, I really can't, I really can't imagine. And, you know, and the thing is, is that, you know, from, from my point of view, um, you know, I don't know, like, like to me, like I, I've actually long argued that it was, it was the, it was the baby boomers that were the first, were the first broken, uh, were the first broken generation. And that essentially because they were broken, um, they had broken kids and because those kids were broken, they're having broken kids and some people are getting help and some people are going to therapy and some people are, are turning themselves around and, and making things right. But, you know, you have, um, you know, I mean, I mean, like, I mean, it, and, and the thing was, is that they all had their problems. I mean, you know, like, well, uh, what a lot of people don't realize is, is, is how difficult it was having parents that were from the greatest generation, right? And what it was like to live under their under their shadow, you know, um, that was really hard on a lot of people. You know, I mean, um, you know, it, it, it really messed with people. And um, you know, you could never live up to your parents because you know your you know your your father you know was a freaking you know admiral in the in the Second World War or was a was a you know was something else in Korea and and you know they'd done these amazing things and and you know and and you know like you know what are you what have you done you know and so forth and so I don't know to me like um you know I think each generation has its challenge and I and I also think too that that one of the you know one of the reasons why I I I love where I live and why I will always struggle so hard to stay here and, and raise my, my children here is that, you know, I mean, you know, take, take your town, for example, right. Um, I know you love living there and, and I'm, and from what I can tell, it's a, it's a beautiful place, but you know, what are the opportunities available to kids? Right. And, and, you know, what, you know, what, what's, what sort of careers are actually available to them and, and, is that always going to either force them to make a choice of staying in where they love and and taking a job they don't want oh, or following the job that they want and having to go somewhere else whereas they where are, i live and, and sorry, that's go ahead. A very good point like in in our town dude there men outnumber women in our town okay so a lot of men what happens is they get involved at 18 years old because they spent high school partying they the, a lot of young men end up going into working in in the uh, in the uh, forest industry. Mm -hmm. Okay, which is very good money that allows mm -hmm. them to buy all their toys early. And what happens is, <coughs> you a lot of these young men um, they they get married early. Okay, uh, you know they. They meet up with a girl either in high school or, or a few years younger with them. Say they're 24 dating a 17-year-old. Uh, and what happens is they entrap them with gifts like a vehicle and and everything like this. And because housing... And, and with that, that ratio, it's not it's honestly not always such a bad move on their part, right? I mean, they find a really good woman and you, you want to keep, but, you know, you want to keep but, her around, you know? Here's the thing. A lot of the generation... Okay, you look at a lot of the younger generation, dude, in my town, it's like a giant 
it's like a giant orgy out there. It, <laughs> it really is. Because you don't get what, what's happening at home. You go and trap someone else. So in our area, there's a lot of single moms or divorced moms that already have one, two, three kids <clears throat> who hook up with somebody else, you know, at 30, 35, and now they want more kids, you know, and that's just the way it goes, right? Oh my goodness. Yeah. And, and, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, where, where, where I live, I mean, I mean, it's got, it's got a lot of, it's got its own problems, right? There's all sorts of problems, right? But I mean, the thing is, is that, you know, um, you know, the, the opportunities that exist where I live and the opportunities that exist within my state, um, you know, I mean, whatever you want to do, I mean, you, you know, you, you want to go, you know, you want to go work at Facebook, Apple, Google, SpaceX, um, you want to go try to do something in Hollywood. You want to try to get into graphic arts. You, you want to like, you want to get into acting. You want to get into music. You want, I mean, like, I mean, the opportunities are just, it's insane. The opportunities here. And, and that, you know, that puts a whole different slant on growing up, you know, because, you know, you, you, you see, you know, you see endless possibilities for yourself, you know, and, and those opportunities are here too. Okay. But, <clears throat> like with with the lower mainland like near vancouver those opportunities are yeah. plentiful yep <clears throat> but anyways i got to get to bed here i could talk about this all night uh but i do have to get to bed yeah like, no worries buddy no worries uh, no worries tomorrow night yeah, on the show uh who's here karen dalman's here um uh, where we are going to have uh talk about the Ouija board tomorrow night. Oh yeah. 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 I, 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 I have, I have, I have questions. Yeah. Karen Dahlman's one of the best when it comes to Ouija board experiences and, and everything like that. So, although I think now my favorite Ouija board story is yours. Yeah. With that lottery ticket, man, that just kills That's me, man. I love yeah. that story yeah. so much. Uh, thank you to all the super <laughs> chatters. Thank you to all our listeners. Uh, I'm going to cut the extra short here because my voice is killing me. But uh, we'll talk to you guys tomorrow night. John, amazing as usual, buddy. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And thanks for everyone for sticking around and listening to, to Dave and I babble. We appreciate it. All right. We love you guys. Take care.